Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the Atlanta CIO Executive Leadership Summit. I'm Hunter Muller, Lead Principal of HMG Strategy. My team and I are delighted to be here with you today. Excited uh, to be with you today to no end. We have a world-class agenda, a world-class program, truly uh, best-in-class speakers that are going to talk about really what matters most now, what matters most now and into the future, learning from the past and present to reshape the future of business. Let's get going. So today is partly powered by Appian. Appian's a really interesting company, a new partner of ours, relatively new partner of ours. Appian's mission statement, we're here to simplify what it takes to turn great ideas into powerful business applications that deliver significant value. The Appian Workforce Safety Solution Service enables organizations to intelligently manage and navigate complexities of returning workers on site while man maintaining privacy and the privacy of the employee health information. You can learn more about Appian at the HMG Marketplace and off the HMG web, uh, home, homepage. So big shout out to our uh, both national partners, uh, Commvault, Magenic, and Darktrace and Zoom today would not be possible without your support. Uh, again, uh, we'll hear more from each of those uh, folks those thought, their, and their thought leaders and their points of view in the market uh, in the next, in the coming hour or two. And a big shout out to the Atlanta SIM chapter. We've been partnering with SIM uh, in Atlanta now for about 10 years uh, and we're a big fan and supporter of SIM around the country. I want to introduce Mark Taylor. Mark Taylor is the CEO of SIM International. Mark, great to have you on the program today. Hey, Hunter. Thank you so much for the invitation. Hey, give us a little quick update. What's new at SIM International? Hey, there's a lot happening right now across the country in the chapters of the, throughout the metros, um, you know, the metro communities across the country. And, uh, you know, as, as you have and with your team, uh, everyone has flipped to a virtual world and we're finding a great opportunity, honestly, to extend our reach through it. And we've found a great connectivity. And frankly, more people getting engaged in the midst of this, uh, you know, uh, COVID uh, than we've ever had before. So in that way, it's, uh, we've seen a, a bit of a boost, Hunter. It's been an, an exciting time as well. So good things happening. We've got some great stuff happening in the fall uh, throughout the, the chapters across the country, as well as some events that you and I are working on uh, for Sim National. Uh, later in the, uh, I guess, the December window when we're putting on an event, we've also got a foundation event that we're doing in November. So uh, great stuff coming up uh, here in the fall. I just want to give a great shout out to the Atlanta team for building a great community there uh, in local, uh, the local uh, Atlanta area, and also for the investment that you make uh, with, uh, with, the, with the Atlanta chapter. We're just really grateful, uh, Hunter, for what you guys do together to help us uh, grow the SIM community. Excellent, Mark. I'm a SIM fan, a, a board member, and a SIM member going on 20 years. Uh, it's been a, one of the top 10 reasons I think I've had such a great career. Uh, SIM's a wonderful uh, uh, community and network. Uh, please check out your local SIM chapter, whether it be Atlanta or any of the other 39 markets around North America. Thanks, Hunter. Thanks, Mark. So next up is the marketplace. It's, a, it's new to HMG. Things have dramatically changed since uh, the pandemic and the, the crisis. And so we've can basically developed a service connecting world-class partners with you uh, as a, a, a practitioner and an owner. We have an interesting uh, video here. It sums it up. Uh, let's play it. Many tech leaders are struggling to find the right solution to their technical business problems. HMG Strategy has created the HMG Marketplace and Reference Center to connect tech leaders with subject matter experts from peer vetted providers of critical services and hot new technologies. The HMG Marketplace, think of it as a reference center, a library to find out more about our partner companies and then set up a meeting. It's challenging for all of us that we can't be together at these events. You won't be meeting necessarily with a salesperson. You're going to be meeting with myself, our senior executive team. This truly is a game changer. Um, we're going to be doing a survey here right now. Um, I think uh, the HMG team is going to launch it. If you all would uh, jump in there, we have over 100 folks on the line right now to get an idea of what's really important here for the future of work survey that we're in uh, working on here at HMG. Do you take a moment to vote there? Uh, that would be excellent. Okay, next up we have Gary Sorrentino. Gary is the deputy CIO, the global deputy CIO of Zoom. Gary, welcome to the program. Hi, Hunter. How are you? Thanks it's for having me. 
Hey, it's great to see you. You know, I can think of not a better success story in this uh, very unusual time we're in right now in uh, economics and the, in the business and the technology environment than Zoom. You guys have been on an amazing ride connecting uh, us through this process. Give, yeah, us a little, give us a little update. I know it's been a real honor. Um, you can imagine somewhere back, uh, I guess back in January, February, we had like uh, 10 million users a day and now we're up to 30X of that. And so it's, it's been a great ride. I mean, helping schools with e-learning, helping doctors and patients with uh, telemedicine, um, helping companies stay connected. Um, it, it's a great tool. Think about it. I'm using the tool all day long, most of the time for business, and then four more calls at night with mom and trivia and happy hours. And so uh, it, because it just works and it's really easy to use, um, we've seen massive growth over the last couple of months. I mean, when you think about it, uh, right, totally un unprecedented, unusual times that we're all in, staying connected, staying engaged really matters both individually uh, for our teams and for our companies and customers, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, think about it. We, we lacked that physical contact for a long time and we substituted it by having video. And along the way, you know, people got video fatigue and, and the phone basically became unusable. Uh, I, I think I've only made three business phone calls in the last six months. Everything's been a Zoom call or, or some form of video conferencing. So I think it filled a gap where I still needed to talk to mom to make her feel comfortable and to make me feel, feel comfortable. But I also needed to be collaborative and productive at work. And so it was great that the same tool did both. And you have some fun with it. You know, that we're, we're putting filters in now uh, to help out on the personal side. I don't know if anybody's seen our new filters. We just came out with 5.2. Um, but we did come out with a great business feature where you're immersed inside the PowerPoint. And that is really powerful where you don't have to look at me and then see my PowerPoint, put me inside the PowerPoint when I talk. And it's actually um, helped really great when people are presenting from that immersive collaborative feeling. Oh, interesting. So when you think about the workplace being redefined uh, in a new norm, what does the future look like? You know, we're talking about, I know I've been talking a lot more about this phase is redefining. And I think the, it used to be we were working at work. That was, wow, way, way, way back January, right? And then we went to living at work. That means basically work came home with us and we were living at work. Then the next stage, I think we were evolving. We were trying to figure out what to do with the kids, the family, work, extended work hours, constant calls, and a little bit of disarray. And I think finally now the world, companies, people are getting out of that I don't want to say panic phase, but I think they're getting out of that phase where, okay, it's time to move forward. It's time to create the next normal. It's time to figure out what the rules are going to be. We need to focus on collaboration. We need to focus on security. We need to focus on productivity. We need to focus on personal safety. And maybe it's time to get the sports t-shirts and the cats out of the video calls, the business video calls. And let's get back to a business new normal. What do you think some of the other changes we can expect? You know, I, I think people are going to be very surprised when they go back to work. We work with a lot of companies right now and obvious things. Look, those um, densified seatings that we were so proud of over the last five years, well, maybe it's every two seats or every three seats. Those two-person huddle rooms, they are now going to be safe single-person offices. If I have to go to an office and I can commandeer a glass huddle room and no one else can get close to me, well, it's almost like being home right? Because I'm sure they'll be zooming you or videoing you inside that room, but that's going to change. Um, we're going to see, of course, the other way, medium rooms will become huddle rooms, large rooms will become medium rooms. But I think what we're going to see is difference where it's not going to be you can just jump into a room ad hoc anymore. We're going to expect 24-7 cleaning services. We're going to want to see cleaning services on the floor. What we're going to want to see is I leave that huddle room, someone comes in and sanitizes the phone. Someone comes in and sanitizes the keyboard so that the next person in there feels safe. I think the last thing also we're going to see is the employees that we survey, they want rules. If I'm going to go back to work and the rule is we have to walk one way on the floor so we, we um, get rid of face-to-face -face contact, I don't want to have to police that rule as an employee. I want that rule to be a corporate rule. And if I have to wear a mask, I don't want to have to police that. I want a corporate. And if there's occupancy rates, I don't want to do that. And also, if there are ways for us to work here and how to collaborate, what are they? They kind of want to be told what the rules are because that's part of them feeling safe. 
know, it's, uh, it's such an unusual time when you think about uh, the usage of uh, Zoom and other media platforms, culture is key to any successful organization. We know that from the late Peter Drucker. And uh, this has been actually a, a cultural accelerator, I think, for many companies. Where do you see really interesting stories or best practices where a company really just dove in, embraced full on digital video, and uh, the culture exploded? Let's break that apart. On the first part, let's talk about something as common as when you went to work, you'd walk around and you'd communicate with people, right? Managers used to do managing or walking around. We made it a slogan, right? That's gone. The other thing is, is that you would jump into a conference room, right? That's probably gone ad hoc, right? That'll have to be more of a scheduled event. But think about devices. One of the devices or the technologies that people have been um, asked about is their phone. Now, there's phones everywhere in an office. Right? And you walk into a huddle room and you pick up a phone and you make a phone call and you sit in a densified huddle room or, or a free seating or whatever we called it. There was a thousand names and there's a phone on the desk. No longer are you going to want to pick up that phone because you don't know where that phone, who's talked on that phone. There's no way to sanitize that phone. So we sat and we worked with one of, one of the companies and they tried to figure out what it would cost to clean that phone during the day as well as overnight. Their employees actually wanted that little sticker you see sometime in their hotels. This phone has been sanitized, right? And so at the end of the day, um, you know what they decided? Let's get rid of the phone. Let's get rid of the problem. Let's move it into voice over IP. And I know everybody on this call is thinking about how to get rid of that device. But what they said was, okay, we got rid of the phone. It's voice over IP. We got to do that quickly. But then what else can we do? And so what they thought about is, why don't we give each employee a foldable keyboard and a Bluetooth headset? You come to work with your own keyboard and your own headset. The things that you touch during the day, you brought in with you. The things that you touch during the day, you brought home with you. If you want to clean it at night, that's up to you. But now I don't have to worry about a cleaning service cleaning the keyboard or cleaning the phone. Why don't we eliminate things? And the other thing is, when that employee is working home in the new hybrid world, his phone number goes home with them. So how do we change cap, uh, OPEX? operational cost of cleaning a phone into CapEx and changing over voice over IP. That's just one story. Hey Gary, can you give this, we have an interesting question in the chat. We have a couple minutes left. Can you touch on the whole 90 day journey uh, in terms of the last, uh, over the last six months, there's a question around uh, security features. Yeah, so, so that's the big part. Everybody knows about the security features. So the 90 day journey. In April, we made a decision, and we made a decision to, to deploy all development and engineering resources towards enhancing privacy and security. And, that, and we did about 100 features, but I don't want everybody out there thinking 100 features that had that many things wrong. Some of them were just like making something on by default, because now the schools needed it on by default, where the enterprises were making that decision for them. And so as we gained new market areas, we had to change some of the controls by turning them on or turning them off. So that was part of it, but we did make seven commitments and not to go through all of them and whoever that is, they can please email me. I always give my email out. It's gary.sorrentino at zoom.us. And I have a great slide presentation on their seven commitments and that whole 90 day journey. But just to, just to summarize it, it was about features and it was about privacy and security. Uh, it was also about bringing in third parties it was also about updating our privacy policy. It was enhancing our bug bounty program. It was creating a CISO council because when I came in, we wanted to say, we want to hear from the client. And there's no better person than a CISO to hear voice of the client. And they came and we met several times through the 90 day journey. And we still meet monthly now. And they helped us prioritize and structure some of the changes because as we got further into EDU and healthcare, and other areas, it was important to hear from the people who are actually going to use these changes and how they wanted them to be. Um, I think you know, I, hit, I think I hit all seven. Um, oh, we also do continuous uh, white box penetration testing, and that'll go all the way till the end of the year. And Eric created the Ask Eric webinar, and he met every week for 13 weeks with somewhere around 20 to 30 thousand people, and it was literally. 20 minutes of presentation and 40 minutes, ask Eric anything you want. And I have a great couple of slides on that. I'll be glad to distribute that to anybody who needs it. Please send me a note. Excellent. Hey, Gary, great to have you on the program. Thanks for supporting us and uh, really appreciate your 
active engagement. One of, one of the best success stories in the last three years is Zoom. Check them out. Well, thank you very much. I'll see you on the panel later. Yes, great. Okay, bye. Next up is Marcus Fowler. Marcus is the Director of St Strategic Threat uh, at Dark Trace. Marcus, great to see you. Hunter, always a pleasure. Hey, you have been busy, man, keeping everyone safe and protected in this new distributed work from home uh, environment. Give us a high level trends. What are you seeing out there? What matters? What's really important as everyone's been working from home now for four months? Sure. And I, and I think the biggest change we saw was you know, the immediate need to need to maintain business operations. So very quickly as that transition to work from home, how quickly can we shift towards and onboard some of these key and critical technologies like Zoom, like some of these SaaS applications, greater dependency on cloud, and all the while that security team is trying to catch up with that digital change, right? So that digital change is happening very quickly and that security team, because of the pace of change was often trying to figure out what are the vulnerabilities around some of these applications and uses that we need to be aware of. And, and I think that really started with what visibility have we lost and how do we regain that, right? And whether that's more people on VPNs or more of that endpoint device that are operating outside the corporate network, how do we wrap our heads around the security vulnerabilities associated there, right? Whether it's an outstanding platform like Zoom or other, how do I start to understand that SaaS login, those SaaS events, while Zoom is getting secure as their platform, how am I also secure and who's logging in and my visibility into my user base and how they're interacting with those platforms? Interesting times, right? So we learned a lot in this global disruption. Uh, when we switched to this remote overnight uh, experience, what were the biggest ahas for you in the, the, the whole experience? How quickly it, and successfully we clicked over to this new distributed workforce, and then uh, essentially how big the threat became, the threat service surface uh, dramatically increased, right? Sure, yeah, I think very quickly, I mean, one thing that really impressed me and, and Darktrace, obviously artificial intelligence company, focusing that technology on cybersecurity, cyber defense, what we really saw in terms of how that visibility and how that environment changed, how well that artificial intelligence actually did in maintaining visibility and continue to alert against, right? It wasn't needing to relearn or re-baseline or re-establish and really starting to think about more of those intelligent approaches and tools with regard to security rather than more static ones that might serve a single purpose but aren't as dynamic as the workforce and as the evolutions that are happening therein. And, and we really as a company started to not just think about our digital transformation, but other companies and how we could meet them in their in their transformation, but do it securely? How can we allow them to lean into the innovation? I think you made some of these comments just before we came on about you know some companies kind of hunkered down hoping this would end. Others took advantage, you know, like a HMG and how we're doing with these events and leaned into making the man advantage of it and making it a point of innovation. Well, how can we be sure to kind of secure that boldness, right? As they innovate with regards around the security that they're gonna depend on to get there. So thank you, Marcus, for the compliment. Appreciate it. Yes, we did. Uh, and we, in fact, we're living it. One, one, two, talk to us a little bit about what makes Dark Trace uniquely different at, from your AI and your learning system as people do migrate to new business models. What's uniquely different about Dark Trace? Sure. Uh, even before the technology, I'll talk about the kind of the security position and optic. And that really is one of threat agnostic, right? I'm not thinking about the threat actor. I'm not trying to predict the next attack. I'm using that artificial intelligence to understand the normal of your digital environment and then enforcing that normal, right? And that's a really different perspective from a security standpoint. And I think it's actually the one that is, is the, of greatest advantage because the level of certainty and consistency, I can, I can understand and defend your environment better than predicting the threat actor is really massively different. So how the, and then the other areas that are critical, especially in this time of crisis, is how we're using AI to augment the security team, right? How can we make the security team and their limited, you know, hours in the day, limited workforce, potentially strained budget, how can we have the, enable them to do more? And that was employing the AI as part of an autonomous triage. So doing some of that security investigation in the background so that the limited time they can put fingers on keyboard, 
They're starting actually from a place of informed action because an investigation has been conducted by their artificial intelligence rather than the earliest part of their day of that initial investigation, you know, saving an hour, two hours of their day so that that critical human resource is doing exactly what you want, working on the hardest problems rather than some of the early elements of an investigation. Interesting. Uh, and when you think about uh, some of the breaches that we've had r recently in the ransomware, it's just skyrocketing, right? Absolutely. And, and the interesting one about some of the two, two most recent ones is they were actually two very different ransomware groups that conducted the attack. But there's some commonality between what you're seeing in terms of how their trade craft is evolving, right? So you actually had business operations were impacted. You also had them going after data that they could then use as pressure to make it to do brand damage, to release publicly, to increase kind of the levers and ability they have to force not only a higher payment, but a quicker payment. Right, and that's really what you're seeing. The return on investment for the attacker continues to be on the rise, especially in ransomware. So that is going nowhere fast. Actually, the only place it is going fast is how, how much they're conducting and how they're conducting. And it's not gonna go away anytime soon. So what are your thoughts, Marcus, on small teams, small companies, mid-size and large cap, the differences, the nuances in terms of a security profile? Let's focus in on small teams. Sure, I mean, small teams, you know, I think that that visibility and that leveraging of technology maybe is almost more crucial in those smaller teams. I know the bigger teams might have a, a deeper personnel bench, but some of that technology and augmenting that human team in those small teams can be some of the biggest steps forward. And I think even before you talk about the technology, it's understanding the risk, right? Understanding your cyber risk and the things that you care most about and are most sensitive to you and then moving your program towards defending that space first and then growing from there. Okay. Um, and any kind of parting comments on Dark Trace and how to get engaged with you folks? Sure. Well, we're, we're an avid user of your marketplace and, and, and really congratulate you again on the, on the launch of that. I think it's a, a huge enabler for, for engagement. Uh, there's also uh, darktrace.com. I think we pretty much have like a library of Congress of white papers and a Netflix of, of webinars and videos on uh, what Dark Trace brings to the table and our capability. Uh, and then you can also find me, uh, Marcus Fowler, uh, on LinkedIn to reach out and ask any questions. Yeah, really appreciate your active engagement, Marcus. And to that end, people can go today, right now, on to the HMG homepage. And I think in the chat, we'll have a link to the marketplace and go in there and learn more about Dark Trace and request a meeting with yourself, right, or Nicole. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, we can give you a great demo and, and we can see kind of what we're talking about and how the AI works, whether it's in your industrial space, enhancing your email security, cloud SaaS or network. It is a platform approach that allows us to kind of grow with and be where you want to digitally transform your company as that, that innovate, as they lean into innovation and want to really be bold. And what does the trial look like or uh, the first 30 to 90 days? It actually, our trials are fairly straightforward. You know, going for 30 days, big question we get early is how fast is this going to learn my environment? And the reality is seven to 10 days, and we're starting to already find interesting finds, interesting vulnerabilities and gaps to address with you. And it, we, we hold your hand throughout it as you have kind of mature with all your understanding around the platform. Hey, Marcus, great to see you. And thanks for coming on the program today. Folks, go to the marketplace and sign up and get a meeting with uh, Marcus or Nicole. I'll Always see you soon. Her. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, next up, we have Rockford Loyota. From, he's the CTO of Magenic. Rocky, welcome to the program. Great to be here. Thank you. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, it's been a while. Yes, I think we were together last in Seattle, right? Yeah, that's right. Great so event. So when you think about CIOs and technology execs, CTOs at a high level, what are the top trends? Top trends tech leaders should be thinking about in supporting, enabling, and driving innovation for the business? Well, what we're seeing right now is that the world events are driving uh, accelerated adoption of cloud, uh, which is a, a big thing and affects not only the technology, but also business capabilities. Um, to get to the cloud effectively requires a commitment of, in terms of DevOps and that's a, a big thing that it probably affects the IT side more than the, the business side. But then all of this combined really requires a fair amount of focus on agile teams uh, in order to really be effective. And 
I think a lot of folks tend to start thinking that agile is a software development thing, but it, if you practice it correctly and really want to get the value, it draws in business folks as well as uh, operations developers and, and everybody across the board. And so it has a pretty substantial impact, not only uh, on sometimes at least on, on software development, but it can extend out into other aspects of the business. Hey, Rocky, you have a really interesting company, uh, right? Based up in, out of Minneapolis, right? National Footprint. Uh, talk to us a little bit about Magenic, who, who you are, what you guys do, and what makes you unique. Yeah, we are a software development consulting firm. Uh, we've got offices around the U.S., including Atlanta, and, and of course, we're headquartered in the Twin Cities. We've got an office in Manila as well, and we deliver uh, custom software solutions that help solve key business problems or, or uh, open up opportunities for our clients. And we do it in a, a fast, agile way that's really focused on process and repeatability, quality, and uh, of course, uh, a lot of the things I just talked about in terms of cloud enablement, DevOps, and agile. So when you think about the mega trends, uh, poking down there one more time, what are you most excited about in terms of the mega trends and how do you help your clients take advantage of those mega trends? Well, we do what we call a player coach model where we really bring in experts that work with our clients, uh, you know, hand in hand. Uh, of course, these days, maybe bring in isn't the right word, but uh, we, we bring them onto conference calls uh, and provide hopefully uh, a great set of examples around how to do agile, how to do DevOps, how to build cloud solutions. And our goal is not only to deliver those great solutions, but also at the end of the day, uh, to leave our clients in a position where they're better able to build their own uh, solutions and, and obviously to maintain the ones that we've helped them build. So any real concrete examples that you can talk about, uh, either uh, specifics, companies, or just uh, kind of a, a you know, you know, white label kind of idea of uh, work you've done to really innovate and drive transformation? Sure. Um, you know, we work across a, a fair number of different industries, uh, including professional services, healthcare, uh, financial services, manufacturing. Um, some of our, our bigger clients include uh, EY, uh, Fiserv, Charles Schwab, uh, Delta Dental. Um, and, and take uh, EY, for example, um, we're working on a, a very large system with them that is all based completely in the cloud uh, and has, oh, I think, maybe 11 or 12 feature teams from an agile perspective. So uh, different teams working together. And, and this really ties into the, I think, importance of agile because these teams are organized into teams of teams. So we're using a, a scaled agile approach. And the teams themselves not only include developers, but also operations folks and business stakeholders. So that on a regular two week cadence, they're always uh, aligned with each other, but also aligned with the business requirements. And uh, that uh, in some ways is maybe one of the best examples that we've got about uh, how to make this really, really work in a large scale setting. Very cool. Ian is a top notch firm and uh, Absolutely. So, so is Charles Schwab. Uh, that's uh, right there in the major leagues. Yeah, well, it's, it's a lot of fun working with these larger companies, building solutions that, that impact a lot of folks, both inside those companies, but then obviously they're building these solutions so that they can turn around and, and uh, have a fantastic impact on their customers. And right. So that, that multiplying effect makes this a lot of fun for everybody involved, I think. I can see you're passionate about that. You know, let's go back to the DevOps trends. Uh, DevOps is pretty fascinating. Let's poke in there a little bit more. Uh, what are those trends? Yeah, you know, when we look at DevOps, it, it's interesting because a lot of what we now call DevOps has been around for a very, very long time. Uh, I think it has helped quite a lot that there's a technical term uh, you know, and a little momentum behind it. And what I've observed and in, in with a lot of our clients is that people start out fixating on the tools and the technology, and, that, and that's fine. Uh, because those are, are critical pieces. But ultimately, DevOps is a culture change. 
and really requires uh, a fair amount of work at an organizational level. Um, something that, that we help at the tool level, but also uh, at this organizational level uh, through coaching and mentoring. Because you have to get the ops people uh, and the security people and the dev people talking to each other and working together as a team when in you know, historically there's been a lot of cultural uh, barriers placed between uh, you know these different groups in an organization and so uh, tearing down those barriers and, and working to make them uh, come together as a productive team that's the key to success. We have a comment uh, here in the chat saying rightly said culture change uh, is key right regarding architecture DevOps and security, all, everyone, has to, everyone has to be all in, right? One team? One team, yeah, that's exactly right. And yeah, so we see a lot of our clients put together a, a DevOps uh, organization inside their org, right? To, to, and then that's a good bridge step, uh, you know, because you've got ops and you've got dev and, and so create a DevOps team. But at the end of the, the, the journey, really having a DevOps team isn't the goal. That's a transitory uh, step because you, again, want your dev folks and your ops folks working together as part of agile teams to be uh, all working in concert toward the same end goal. Let's talk about uh, agile uh, and the trends in agile. Uh, thoughts there? You know, that has become so critical because, and you know, again, not a new thing, but this accelerated move to the cloud coupled with everybody working from home or working remote uh, really drives the need for uh, good communication balanced with enough time for people to have uh, uh, actually get their head in the game and, and do some focused work. That by itself is a, an interesting challenge. Um, you know, I think working remote has led to a lot of interruptions for a lot of us where it's difficult to block off time. But, you know, and this is something where Magenic has been, I think, maybe not in a unique spot, but a, definitely a good one in that we've been a distributed company for many, many years now uh, between our several offices in the US people, I think we've got employees in 35 different states and then Manila. We're used to working in a, in a collaborative manner using various tools like Zoom or Teams or, or different things like that. And a lot of our clients are not. And so it's been an a interesting journey as everybody in, in has scrambled to rapidly readjust how to uh, coordinate these teams and, and maintain this balance between a lot of communication and teamwork, but also time for folks to have heads down work. What are you most passionate about in this trend that we're in right now? You know, the NASDAQ, all-time high, uh, clearly technology uh, being one of the winners out of this uh, pandemic. Uh, every company now is considered a technology company. Every company needs technology expertise at a board level, the line of business, and the C-suite. Any thoughts there? Well, that's really true. And it's an interesting challenge because there's you know, a lot of folks that are in business that uh, were shielded from technology. And now it's in everybody's face, whether we like it or not. And um, that by itself poses a set of interesting challenges. I think that breaking uh, big projects down into smaller feature teams or work groups is really a key, especially if those work groups include cross-sectional uh, sets of talent. So you've got some tech folks, some business folks, you know, maybe some QA or QE folks. And so there's a lot of learning that goes on, not only about the task at hand, but also because we're working collectively as these cross-cutting teams, we end up spreading knowledge about, uh, you know, the best ways to use technology, best ways to use collaboration tools. Uh, and, and I think it's a bi-directional learning where the tech folks often gain a much deeper appreciation for, for what business people are trying to accomplish. And a lot of business folks gain a much deeper appreciation for the expertise and, and the tools that are available from the tech side. Hey, Rocky, great uh, to have you come on the program. How can people get in touch with you and uh, the team? Well, the best way certainly is to go to magenic.com. We've got a website that explains everything that we uh, do and provides uh, great opportunities to contact us. 
Excellent. Thanks for coming on the program and thanks for supporting us. Great to wow. see you. My pleasure. Thanks very much. Good to see you. We'll see you, see you again soon. Uh, next up, it's the Jay Farrow, the CIO of QuickCrete and the complete CIO. Jay, you ready to roll? Hey, Hunter. How you doing, pal? Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you. Yeah, we're ready to roll, man. Take it away. All right. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, I have an all-star panel, and uh, I'm going to leave most of the, uh, the intelligence to them. But uh, so the notion of the complete CIO leader is interesting. And a little bit about that. Uh, I was asked a few months ago, probably even longer than that, pre-pandemic, one time during an interview, and, and the interviewer said, Jay, do you consider yourself a strategic CIO or do you consider yourself an operational CIO? And it was really a curious question. And I immediately thought to myself, well, why wouldn't I be both? I consider myself at least an aspirationally complete CIO. And it really spawned off a conversation about how I think world-class CIOs really need to focus on, on both areas, which then kind of led to a further uh, this dialogue around softer things that maybe CIOs and leaders don't always focus on. We get, tend to get mired in the, the bits and bytes and maybe our focus is pulled into operational issues and focusing on leadership development, uh, mentoring, diversity, inclusion, all of the things that world-class leaders of any discipline need to focus on. So I have with me an all-star panel that we're gonna discuss this a little bit. Um, I'm, rather than me, uh, introduce them. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but I'm, I'm honored to have these four world-class leaders with us. So, Sean, why don't you get us started? All right. Sean Hunt, CIO of McKinney's. Uh, we're a leading construction company uh, enabling the critical infrastructure for um, data centers, schools, uh, hospitals right now. So, um, definitely, uh, you know, Jay, I am uh, well known for my soft skills. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> all right. So Sean will be our cautionary tale of what not to do today. And uh, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. And who's next? Kim. Hi, everyone. My name is Kim Travison, and I'm the CIO of All Castle APG. We're a leading manufacturer of building products uh, in North America and now globally. Uh, pretty excited to be here with this All Star cast. Thanks, Kim. No worries. And Bill, take it away. Hi, Jay. Bill Van Curren here from NCR Corporation, um, the global CIO for the company leading transformation for restaurants, banks, and retailers. Fantastic. Bill, thanks for being here. And Serena. Hey, Jay. Uh, this is Serena Sachs. Uh, I just uh, was the Last six years, the CIO of Fulton County Schools here north and south of Atlanta. And uh, next week, I will announce my new adventure. Fantastic. Well, congratulations. We'll look forward to that. Whatever it is, I'm sure you're going to be amazing at it as you were with your last adventure. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's start with you. Let's stick with you, Serena. When you think about the term, the complete CIO leader, what comes to mind with you? You know, Jay, I was glad that you brought that up on the uh, prep session here, because I, I really do think that, you know, there isn't room for just one type, right? We have to, and that's what's making the CIO job difficult these days. We have to be multifaceted, we have to be people leaders, not just uh, technology leaders, and um, really be uh, understanding of the business. And so, you know, your, your supervisor, whether it's a CEO or whatever, is going to expect operational excellence, right? That's a given. Keep the lights on, 99, Six Sigma availability, you know, drive budget efficiency year after year, but that's not enough anymore. We also have to be experts in the business and how to improve whatever business outcomes uh, are set forth in the strategic plan or annual objectives. We have to be able to del deliver technology solutions that enable those objectives and the mission of the organization. I think that's well said. Bill, where do things come off track? I mean, that seems to make common sense, uh, you know, to me. And I, and I know you, you and I have known each other. I've known all of you for many, many years. And I mean, I consider you a very complete CIO uh, and all four of you, really, and even Sean. And um, no, but, but Bill, where do things go awry? I mean, what, 
I mean, it, Guys, clearly there are operational only CIOs. Where, where does it come off the rails? Yeah, I think it comes off the rails or it comes off track in, in time management and uh, your ability to, to delegate to a really highly proficient staff. So to do the things you mentioned, Jay, you mentioned board participation, you mentioned uh, mentorships, right? You mentioned strategic planning and engagement. In order to free up time to do those things, you have to have a really uh, well-developed staff that can handle the operational issues, the escalations, the change management, the day-to-day. -day. If you don't have the strong staff, you're, you're going to get pulled back into that. You'll have less time to do, to do the strategic thing. So I think that's where it comes off the rails. And I think also just uh, you sit in your comfort zone too long. You've got to take risks. You've got to jump into some conversations that you might not feel comfortable with, but you've got to step in there to learn, learn the functions and learn all functions of the company. Spend time building those relationships with everybody in the C-suite and trying to balance that time. That's, that's where I think it comes off track, Jay. I think that's well said. Kim, what do you think? Yeah, I would agree with that too. I think that, you know, the, the advent of, if just the, the more of a conversion between um, technology in our day-to-day -day life has meant that CIOs are not just looking at the enterprise level of technology, but it's also around how do we manage the consumerization of technology in an enterprise. So, you know, just focusing on the operations and just the tactics, I think, um, I think that's not a modern CIO, right? We talk about complete CIO, we think about modern CIO. It really all just comes down to business value. If your business only values keep the lights on, then you're going to be an operational CIO. If your business values the strategic value, uh, the, the strategic differentiation that IT can bring to a particular market, then you've got the ability to be a strategic CIO. But I do think that in, in today's sort of modern era, we're, we're really straddling both components, right? And I think exactly to Bill's point, it comes down to having um, tenured leaders on your team who can actually run their components. More importantly, for you as a CIO to get the hell out of the way, empower your people to do the right things. They know what they're doing. Your job is to make sure that you're removing the impediments and helping to drive the organization forward. Was this always the case, Sean? I mean, was the role of the CIO, I mean, is this a relatively new phenomenon? Is it, uh, is it table stakes today? Is it, what's different? Yeah, I mean, uh, personally, I, I, I think it is table stakes. I mean, with the advent of cloud and SaaS, um, you know, any department can essentially uh, procure technology. And so James Dallas always has a, a great quote. He says, uh, I love shadow IT as long as I'm the one casting the shadow. <laughs> and so, you know, today, I, I really do think that for CIOs, just, just like um, other C-suite, it really does come down to relationships. And so, you know, there's, there's not a, a, a wonder why so many CEOs come up from the, the sales ranks is because they are naturally building relationships among their peers. And so I, I really think for the complete CIO, it can get off the, the rails quite easily. If you spend too much time with your direct reports or your technology and not out there meeting with your peers and building relationships. No, I think that's spot on. And I think we tend to settle down to our comfort zone, don't we? Serena, what, do you, what say you? Yeah, I think I want to add one more thing. I agree with what everybody said, but uh, resources. So the business doesn't always fund IT or technology at the level that's needed. So yes, we should always be driving efficiency, but sometimes these strategic initiatives need additional funding. And sometimes you have to make an investment to get a savings. And so we're always balancing resources. And I don't just mean money, I mean time and people as well. Which I think, and I think it's a terrific point, that, doesn't that put the onus on us then to, to Bill's point, excel at the operational blocking and tackling, right? Yes. Because that's where dollars can be found. Safe. I know Sean yeah. and I, you know, uh, full disclosure, Sean and I worked together many times at AIG and the American Cancer Society, and we self-funded a lot of our initiatives over the years, right. not because we didn't get dollars, uh, we certainly did get dollars, but um, we were able to find them through operational efficiencies, removing duplications, simplifying processes, automating things. And so I, I think, and I'd love to hear everybody's thoughts. I mean, we have to have a constant eye on continual improvement of our operations. And Bill, you said it right. I mean, that's the reason football teams focus on blocking and tackling as much as they do. And, and they run drills. I mean, they're not practicing the Hail Mary five hours a day or complex plays. They're practicing tackling and in the basics. basics, aren't they? You still keep a pulse on it. Yeah, I've just added, I'm not saying step away from it totally. Right. Um, let's say, for example, 
the first couple of years in the job, maybe you do a, a monthly ops review. You get comfortable with the team and then you say, hey, maybe I just do this quarterly and let your VP of infrastructure run those on the off month. So again, delegating responsibility and accountability, but don't take your, don't take your pulse off of it totally and maybe change management. Maybe you only approve changes at, at uh, year end or whatever your peak season is. Maybe you just step in and say, hey, for those critical peak season times, I'd like to be in the review process. So yeah, don't, don't take your, your finger, or your pulse off of it completely. You've got to stay in touch with it. And Jay, it's great if you can self-fund by finding savings, but I think we also need to be able to speak the, the language of business, which is finance Absolutely. and find ROIs and NPVs and um, you know, have, have some projects cost justified. So. Oh, I agree, 100. percent I, I think it's a it's a both and, right? And 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 yes. um, we we need to be able to put it in their terms too, not right. The mag the magnificence of the technology speaks for itself. You know, they they need to know what's in it for me, and so right. the, I think the onus is on us now more than ever to really understand how organizations make money, how they service their customers, and even if it's in public ed or nonprofit. It's the same dynamics, right? You have customers, you have inputs, you have outputs. You, you have to know that, that business intimately so that you can speak that language and get credibility. I 100% agree with you, Jay. Yeah, go ahead, Kim. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, one of the things, and we've talked about business and IT strategic alignment for decades. I think I wrote my dissertation on it, like literally way back in the late 90s. Right? So when we think about, you know, we talk about IT and the business, let's be really clear. IT is a part of the business. Yeah. We're a very integral part of the business. So it's about speaking our common language and it's much about educating business folk around the components of IT as it is about teaching IT people about the business. And when I think about resourcing my team and bringing leaders into my team, I am more likely to bring in a business leader that I can teach technology to then bringing in a technology guy I can teach the business to because there's a bit of a nuance. And I do think you need balance and clearly that's not true for every role, but in my business facing roles and my solutions focused roles, that's really the impetus because we are the business and we are teaching our business how to think about solving problems and working in a different way that includes technology, not sends it to the side. So before when we started talking about value proposition, it truly is about how technology can bring value, whether it's efficiencies or cost reduction, risk reduction, avoidance, um, or the ability to generate new revenues through new technology and innovation. That is, those are business things, right? And that's what I, I would argue that every single one of us on this call and certainly beyond this call, that's what we strive from it on a regular basis. I, I absolutely, you know, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and, and Brett Flora uh, in our chat says, amen, Kim. So just uh, <laughs> Brett, Brett agrees Thank with you, us. Brett. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, Sean, you know, earning that kind of credibility, um, how, well, two things. One, how does IT, and if, if you're a new CIO in an organization that perhaps isn't as enlightened as, as another or, or, you know, IT has been seen as a back office function. A, how do you get that credibility to, to be a more complete CIO? And B, how, how do you empower your teams, not just you as the CIO, but your team top to bottom to truly understand uh, that business and feel free and empowered to bring ideas and uh, drive the business forward? Yeah, well, I'll try to unpack that one. That was uh, a lot That's of- a lot. Yeah, we could probably do an hour on that. So that just one. in a nutshell. But, uh, you know, McKinney's, when I first joined, uh, was perceived as a, a traditional uh, construction company. Uh, we have uh, an aging workforce. And so there was, you know, a lot of stigma that uh, construction folks might not be uh, the most technology savvy. And so I think part of it, it starts with just a mindset to say, no, um, you know, technology, if you make it easy, um, can be a thing that everyone uh, can participate on. And so that means enabling your team uh, to do uh, the things that will make them successful, but also enabling your business partners to say, no, we're, we're not trying to solve, you know, what widget we're selecting. Uh, we're trying to solve business problems and let's talk about it and build those relationships and see where the technology may fit. Um, or maybe it's a business process change or maybe it's a personnel change. But when, when you get all the people, um, you know, working in the, the right direction uh, for that strategic plan, I think a lot of those relationships build and you can get from what might be perceived as a technology laggard to a, a technology leader. 
I think it's a great point. I, I think it's a great point. Bill, how are you educating your team uh, to get, I mean, to be a more complete IT uh, resource, whether when, in whatever role, how are you educating the, the NCR IT organization to truly understand what NCR does and, and add that additional value? Well, again, I think it, it comes back to the, the staff alignments, right? So what I try to do is make sure that we have a seat at the table and all the business units. So we're a little bit of a diverse, sort of a small conglomerate, like we're no GE or anything like that, but we've got you know three big lines of business and probably four big global functions. So to make sure that they're um, educated and informed in the business, they have a seat at the table, right? I think that's the only way, back to your earlier point, how do I have time to attend this conference or have strategic meetings uh, with other, other boards, other suppliers, et cetera, is because I've got my team well entrenched. So that, that, that doesn't happen overnight. You've got to establish that credibility and then a seat at the table, whether that's a federated CIO group, which I'm not a big fan of, by the way, or more of a uh, business partner role, BPM. I call it a strategic IT partner role that's sitting at the table, right, with the CFO, with the head of operations, uh, with the CTO, and so on down, down the line. Right. They're, they're entrenched in the business. They need to speak the language of business and prioritize uh, our activities based on, on the business. I think the point Kim made was, was spot on. Uh, we are part of the business. We're not separate from the business. Uh, so we have to, be, have to be at the table. We have to be prioritizing uh, along with the business and uh, guiding them on new ideas, new innovation. So that, that's how I would answer that, Jay. I agree. And I, and I think that once we have that seat, we never own it, right? It's always rented and your, you and your IT organization have to pay that rent every day through delivery. And, and you've heard me say, and I think all of us have said, nobody really cares about our wild haired ideas or our innovation if email and some of the core functions aren't working. The trains always have to run on time. So it's not about just making operations so easy that we forget about it. it it's just making it an equal focus and always looking for ways to improve that, you know, improve that experience. Uh, David says, uh, what a powerful panel. Awesome ideas. Thank you, David. Hey, and David. Joe Topinka. Hey, Joe, how you doing? He says, digital transformation is more about the evolution of the C-suite and their understanding of what expectations they should have regarding IT. I agree. Uh, I agree. I think you all would too. So let me ask you this. Let's say there's a CIO listening out there or an IT executive and he or she maybe looks at their port personal portfolio of skills and says, man, this sounds good. I need to shore up this, this particular area of my leadership portfolio. How do they do that? How do, how do they, we say, you know, well, they need to go learn, but what are those avenues, how they, how they can strengthen their, their personal uh, portfolio? I think, first of all, panels like this, right? I mean, listening to folks who are complete, are very successful at it. I'm not including me in that, by the way, but. Uh, <laughs> But how else can they learn? So, so how about I'll special bring... assignments? Why don't yeah, you go that's... ahead, Serena? You go. You go. Serena. Sorry. So, yeah, I agree with that as well. But I just want to make a plug for uh, so the the CEO of Sim is one of the sponsors of this, and what I have found is one of the most powerful tools for developing IT leadership is the Sim Regional Leadership Forum (RLF). I have sent dozens of people to the regional leadership forum and I've presented at it um, for every year for the last 10 or 12 years. And uh, you really do see um, a life change and soft skill development as we we're talking about before uh, out of this. They don't talk anything about technology. Um, so I really do recommend RLF. But I also, I, I agree with what Bill was saying and it's, you know, I uh, had a practice at Fulton County Schools of bringing people in at the ground level and then developing them and promoting them up through the business. So people would come in as school tech specialists, for example, and we had in the central office 50 people that had been promoted from up over the years through those positions. So they had hands-on experience. They knew exactly what happens at schools. They have that perspective. And then we grew, as Amy was saying, we grew their technical skills and their leadership skills, but they always retain, just like you would in the retail, start on the floor, start on the ground floor and move your way up. Mm -hmm. I think the other part too is about really maintaining a growth mindset because I don't think there's any one channel that works holistically for everybody. Uh, for me personally, I, you know, when I run on the treadmill, I watch TED Talks because it doesn't necessarily, it means I can get snippets of information. I reach out to my network of peers and ask them questions like, am I crazy for thinking this? 
Um, have you tried to do this type of thing? So I leveraged my network as best I can to help learn, actually learn from the people who work in my organization as well, um, because they can help groom me to be an even better leader because they're able to tell me what they need in a leader and what I'm doing well and what I'm not, you know, not doing as well. And, and so then we're consistently growing and learning together. So, I mean, yeah, we can talk about hard skills and what technical aptitudes do you need to have. We can talk about soft skills and leadership. At the end of the day, it really comes down to um, people, empowerment of people, the empathy that you have, your ability to articulate a vision and rally support for that. Um, but I would tell you the number one job, and I probably spend most of my time doing this, is being the chief storyteller for technology. Like we are the business, mm -hmm. we're the technology piece and arm of the business. And so for me, it's about continuing to grow that story with our business partners, not, you know, not doing stuff to them, but doing stuff with them. So, but again, I, I do think it's about leveraging all of those resources, whether they're official or unofficial, um, because I think it's, you can take that inspiration and that drive um, from, any, from every place. Yeah, I, I, I definitely. Yeah, like I was going to say volunteer to to take on another assignment. You know, just mm -hmm. to, to jump onto what Serena was saying. A lot of CIOs have something attached to their org chart that's not a natural IT thing. Some CIOs run procurement. Uh, some CIOs run back office operations and other things, call centers for customers. So I think something like that 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 you volunteer for and say, hey, I can do that. Maybe the company's going through a big transformation in one business area, and you volunteer to help lead that. So something sort of outside the comfort zone to get uh, different exposure so, so that you're not labeled as the techie or the IT person. No, I think that's spot on, Sean. I was just gonna add on to uh, what Bill said for those special projects. I think there's um, opportunities for IT leaders at every level. Uh, one of the things we do at our organization is we form very small tiger teams to uh, provide that empowerment. So you can take one uh, technologist and a cross-functional group of maybe three or four other folks and, and really put some muscle behind um, solving some of the critical business processes or business problems or opportunities. And so I think if you combine those, uh, it, it doesn't have to be necessarily uh, the highest leadership level um, if you're getting that cross-functional visibility. Well, I have to give Sean a shout out because I remember very, very early on when I met him and he's probably wondering what the hell I'm going to say, but it, it's uh, when we met back in, God, 2004, five, uh, a lifetime ago, which is hard to believe, um, Sean was not married at the time. He was uh, a swinging single and before he had kids and I had never met anybody that was a, such a voracious learner than, than Sean was and I'm sure he's still the same, although he's distracted now in a very good way by his much better half and his two amazing kids, but um, he, he, would, we, he had this gigantic chair in his office that was like a Blue's Clues chair, if you're familiar with that, and, and he would just stay to the wee hours of the night, immersing himself in new trends and books, and he'd come in, and we'd come in the following day or after a weekend, and he'd have read three books this thick on a particular topic, and come up with these wild ideas that generally were right most of the time, and um, I just remember being really mad because my kids were much younger at the time and I had no time to do that. And damn it, Sean, you- You're almost an empty nester. I am almost an empty nester. Now. All right, hey, listen, back to the, the matter at hand and we have about five minutes left. And I, I do want to get to, we have a great question here from uh, Shokat Al-Balmani, uh, Balmani, excuse me, Shokat. And he says, IT is business, but mostly from the IT perspective, how do you have business partners also see it that way. So I, if, if I was just to sort of skim that really quickly, you know, do the, do the business partner see IT as part of the business is what I think we're suggesting, right? And I, I can speak for myself personally, the answer is yes. Uh, primarily because I get, I get to have a seat at that table, right? I sit at the business table and bring to the table um, conversations about technology and how it can be leveraged and, and those types of things. I don't know that that's broadly the case. And I think some of it is uh, we need more enlightened CFOs and CEOs, right? Um, but I think in, in a lot of cases, certainly as we're thinking through aligning technology to that business value stream, it's hard to, to unravel those things, right? And so for me personally, we have aligned IT functions to value stream. So the things that we do are directly related to what did, um, actually generates value for the business. So for us, it, it, it is part and parcel. It's, it's two sides of the same coin. 
And now that I, I, I see like Hunter to... pop up, I mean, that means my time is running out. Hunter, <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> I see Hunter looming, looming You're closely. You're not getting the hook. Keep Can going. Can I just add one thing that uh, I think that this uh, crisis, you know, you never want to waste a good crisis. And this COVID crisis, if, if there no nothing else is proving to every single business that they can't operate without technology. So it's, it's, you know, I've seen it in education, but I've seen it in every other business that this time, this era is uh, really forcing the issue that the business and technology are completely intermingled. Well, it's to Hunter's point, it's an unprecedented time. And I think all of the things we talked about today uh, really are emphasized and highlighted during this time, right? And especially the last four or five months, leaders are made and galvanized during crisis, not, not when it's calm. Um, and I know all four of you have excelled at that. Bill and Sean, any final thoughts before we uh, turn it back over to Hunter? My only uh, thing is you asked, you know, how, how technical does a CEO or CIO need to be? Right. Um, I think really one of the only things that we didn't really touch on too much is given the trend of so much rapid digitization, uh, a CIO really needs to be up on uh, AI, RPA, um, really needs to understand how data is going to move the needle. So I don't think there has to be uh, that person that knows every bit of the technology of an organization. Uh, but one thing for, for our listeners is if you're not paying attention to that trend, um, I think you're going to be missing out um, over the, the years to come. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sean. Bill, yeah, last Jay, word. Jay, my final thought is that a complete CIO does not have to be a career CIO, although I have been. It's just taken me a long time <laughs> to be complete because I've been in the role, you know, CIO roles you have many, well, many you're years. Well, world, you're world class, my friend. You're yeah, world class. Yeah, it just takes a lot of years. So I think for those of you who are new in the role, like don't, don't, like, don't sweat the details. Like it, it takes a while to, to get to that point where you're totally comfortable in, in the role. And um, just don't worry about that. So again, complete CIO, CIO does not have to be a career CIO. And, and the last piece of advice, thank you, Bill, is the last bit of advice I would give is listen to these four. So Sean, Kim, Serena, Bill, all world-class CIOs, thank you so much for being here today. Hunter, back to you. Hey, Jay, great job. Thanks, Kim, Serena, Sean, and Bill for being on the program. Perfect job. I mean, isn't it the best time ever to be in the tech industry? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Hey, stay with us to the end of the program. We're going to be recognizing your friend, Jay Farrow, as the CIO, uh, top CIO that matters. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks folks. Everyone. Good to see you all. Hey, next up, we have Brian Brockway. Brian's the VP and CTO of Commvault in securing and protecting your sensitive data in the new normal. Brock, welcome to the program. Hey, Andre, glad to, glad to see you. Hey, it's great to see you as well. Hey, uh, a little context. Uh, you have a unique background uh, in industry, uh, a real thought leader in your space. Uh, kind of a minute on your on set context from your background. Yeah, so actually I was in, it, kind of in, enjoying it uh, in, the, in the previous conversation around the kind of the complete nature. So I've been in, uh, in the uh, technology provider space with Commvault for, I'm going to say, the, la the last uh, 17 years. But uh, prior to that, came out of the analyst uh, area, Gartner, and a few other places along with Wall Street along the way. So uh, in trying to infuse the business and IT together and, uh, and really come out with the value outcomes, that's <clears throat> what I, I love, that, love that conversation they were just going through before. Certainly a real, thought, a real thought leader in, in and around protecting data, right? Um, and you folks have some news, a new, a new announcement with Microsoft. Uh, yeah, so so we've always been a, a great uh, provider and partner with Microsoft for many years. Um, but one of the big shifts and changes, I think, as we've all seen the last, uh, you know, SaaS and cloud and everything else is starting to move and shift and uh, and the agility in the cloud quickly. Um, we started some programs of how do we take the Commvault model and solution set and start to deliver it through much more of a SaaS-based model. And it's something we uh, actually built built around the Azure model. Uh, and we've been doing some great new programs with Microsoft to say, how do we bring that to market faster? Uh, and especially as a lot of customers are, you know, suddenly last March, <laughs> you shifted, you shifted whether you liked it or not uh, to everybody outside. Um, the data moves, the security moves, the problem moves, and you need to make sure how do we have that well protected and 
uh, if something does hiccup in a bad way, you know, how can we ensure we can get through that problem and get back to business as quickly as possible? As we, thank you. As we discussed, every, te- every company is a technology company. Uh, more than ever, uh, tech is uh, a strategic accelerator on innovation, disruption in the boardroom, the C-suite, as well as the line of business. And data matters. Talk to us about why data matters and why data is the new goal. I think it, it, the, the D in digital uh, starts with data. So it's as that data is getting created and shared and produced on a fast basis. And that's, I think, one of the key things we see these days. While agility is increasing, a lot of that conversation on DevOps and everything else, uh, it allows things to go faster. You can get through projects faster. That's all terrific. Uh, unfortunately, in today's day and age, you have to think about the downside of what happens when something goes bad. So there's now, as you start to move out of your data centers and your four walls of control, there's a lot more risks that you have to start to deal with on either people making large scale mistakes um, or bad actors coming back into the environment. So you, you see it every day on you know, ransomware and it's not a uh, problem stuck in one vertical. Uh, it's now up and down the board from you know, K through eight schools all the way up to state and local and uh, um, uh, national governments. And, and that can be pretty costly as well. Absolutely. We've, uh, there's some good studies out there, you know, from uh, the folks at Accenture and others that are kind of pegged. Uh, some of these cyber events usually have a starting price of around $10 million. So it's not just the, the cost to go back in and, and reset yourself, but what's the impact across the organization, and other aspects. Uh, I'll say personally, and us being in the uh, protection and recovery space, uh, we, we have some weekly events, unfortunately, that we're helping customers through on a regular basis. We've got customers that have, you know, uh, gone through an event, recovered back. It takes about a month to rebuild the business in some cases, and some of those events have cost them upwards of $100 million. Um, so it's, uh, it's about shutting down supply chains. It's about, you know, coming over and really having a, a, a massive uh, effect on the business. And it's really enforcing much more of a, a desire to come back over and say, have we built a, uh, a proactive recovery strategy that's not just on paper, but it's actually uh, built policy, automated, tested, and driven and executed on a regular basis. Rock, let's talk about uh, the recovery readiness uh, model that you have. Sure. So, uh, and a lot of this has come out of that best practice. Um, so as, as we've seen a lot of big organizations go through these events, what's the key learnings after afterwards? How do we go back in and ensure, you know, we fix the problems and we uh, eliminate eliminate some of the issues on a go forward basis. Uh, a lot of it starts with a first layer, you know, go in and look at your data, uh, data environment. Uh, how, what does your foundation look like? Do you have, do you have copies? Where are the copies? What's your security models look like? Um, in the agile nature, uh, you don't want to have one person that has the full credentials for the application and all the data copies, because uh, if the credentials get compromised, <laughs> uh, they can wreak havoc, wreak havoc on the top and the bottom. Uh, second is once you once you have a good solid foundation, you've got some separations and, and your data copies are in good uh, in good working order then you start to go back in and say, now we really have to test and validate. Um, it's not just about, do we have backups? Can we go through a full exercise to go back and recover data and applications to a full usable state? Uh, these are some of the things years ago, it was kind of a <clears throat> once a year DR exercise you did for the board. Uh, we see most progressive companies now coming back in and saying, there's a sample set, uh, they have to randomly pick and do this on a quarterly basis for the board and just for, you know, de-risking the business. After that, and then, then you kind of situate yourself into policies. You know, how do I have my most critical to my least critical? How do I apply cost against that model to make sure that I'm not uh, um, uh, exploding my budget? And then when I have it all tied together, it's policy based, you know, how do I apply some reporting and some AI to it to say, uh, what's my readiness score? You know, can I, uh, almost like your credit score. Do you want to measure yourself on your level of risk and are you maintaining it at the right and low level? So then um, how do people get started with a program like this with you all? Yeah, it, and, and a lot of it is, uh, you know, not always a complete change out. It's uh, coming over and really starting to assess the uh, current state operations. Um, 
looking through something like a recovery readiness type model, uh, a little bit of self-assessment <clears throat> to see uh, how does your organization stand today as your data sets and applications have started moving around, have you started to apply more governance and control? Um, it's coming back over and looking at some of the different dimensions. So it's usually starts with a little bit of an assessment to kind of get an understanding of where you stand today. And then you're able to come over and start to prioritize where's the, the most critical areas that you want to start to go off in, you know, put some course correction to and really start to lock down. And we see a lot of companies starting to really start with a lot of the progression as they move to the cloud environments, back to kind of like our uh, Microsoft announcements, some of those new cloud workloads. Uh, the application moved, you're still responsible for the data. Uh, if the data has problems because of mistakes or, or bad actors, that's still your responsibility. Uh, the cloud provider uh, is all about uptime. The data is your own responsibility. So that's really where you have to come over. Make sure you have a strong strategy built around it. And do you have a uh, uh, effective mechanism uh, with a lot of automation, you know, coming right out of the box for it. Great. Um, and no doubt you guys work cross industry. Uh, any industries uh, more su susceptible to uh, issues than others? Uh, I'd say uh, a couple years ago, you know, it was more of the high stakes industries. Uh, healthcare went through the first stages and then uh, financial services was kind of the next layers. Uh, I will say, unfortunately, these days um, we're seeing, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a risk factor that goes across the board. So we've seen, you know, small little community uh, governments. Uh, we've seen schools. We've seen manufacturing companies and supply chains. Uh, the, the nature on the outside of bad actors is they're just going after any data has value independent of what vertical you're in. If they can get access to it, that's how they can really start to cause havoc and, and, uh, and problems. So hey, Brock, it's really uh, it's, again, it's a universal problem now. Again, Brock, how can folks get in touch with you? Sure. Uh, so my email uh, is bbrockway at convault.com. I think one of the thank yous we'll do from the sessions today too is uh, we've constructed up a nice discussion guide paper. Uh, that really kind of helps the CISO teams and the CIO teams and the CTO team kind of sit down and start to think about this, this whole nature of uh, recovery readiness uh, back in your own organization and uh, help you navigate through the technology, the business and the risk and uh, see if you can uh, normalize yourself. Excellent. Hey, Brock, thanks for coming on the program and uh, thanks for having Convault because it's a great national partner. Our pleasure. Uh, great, great sessions and, and fantastic uh, feedback from uh, all the different uh, all the different discussions. Good to see you. Thanks we'll a lot, see you soon. Cheers. Cheers. Next up, we have uh, Bill Van Kern, Senior Vice President, CIO of NCR. Bill, welcome to the program. And the, the panel is going to be digital innovation in a highly distributed environment. What a great panel. Good to see you all. Good to be on. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see y'all. Is Bill going to join us? I see him. Yeah, the host has me, uh, my video stopped. So. Oh, really? Okay. Um, well, let's get it. Thank see you. See me now? We got you now. Got gotcha. you now. Okay. Better, better late take, than ever. Take it away, Bill. Okay. Thank you, Hunter. Yeah, this is, this is uh, going to be my favorite topic of the day. Nothing against Jay. Jay had a great topic. Uh, appreciated being on Jay's panel. But this one is really uh, timely in a sense. Um, how do we as leaders continue to lead the digital transformation given this time of great uh, work from home, virtual environment, great disruption, right? So what are the, what are the effective ways that we've um, asked our teams to collaborate? How are we engaging them in disruptive uh, technologies to help our companies survive during this, uh, during this pandemic? So we've got a great panel today. I've got Alan Stukalski from Ransat. I've got uh, Joseph Dyer from ICF International. And uh, I've got Gary Sorrento, you heard from earlier. And um, there was one other panelist, uh, Gary Brantley from uh, City of Atlanta. I don't know if Gary's going to be able to join in. So I'm going to jump right in, uh, hoping that Gary will, will catch up with us. So um, some of the questions, I'll just start with Alan. Um, Alan, uh, maybe just uh, when, I, when I call on you, give a brief intro of your company, but we're going to keep it short here. So how did the pandemic spur you know, innovation for you and your team, Alan? Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Bill. Um, again, uh, Alan Stukowski. I'm uh, Chief Digital Officer with Ronstad North America. We're the uh, largest uh, global staffing firm. And I, um, 
my, my role as chief digital officer, I'm responsible for all of our uh, CIOs, but I, I really took on a, a position a few years about, ago about really bringing the business through this digital journey. And um, it's been quite a ride. So I think what, uh, going back to your question, kind of how does the pandemic spurred it on, on I would say it's um, made it move faster, right? I think all of us uh, were, were challenged at the beginning of the pandemic as the work from home approach really uh, went from, from one day, uh, most companies were, did a little bit of work from home to we had the whole company working from home effectively. And that was just quite a, quite a feat. Mm -hmm. um, but, but for me, where, where my focus has been around innovation and, and what it has spurred is new products and new product innovation. We have um, since the pandemic come out with uh, three new products that we're se selling on the market now that uh, really didn't even exist before. So bringing new solutions to our customers um, and have really ramped those up and tried to you know, really pivot and become um, more digital in our solutions and ensuring that our clients kind of come along this, uh, this road with us. Most of these solutions that I'm talking about are, are really around uh, new roles and new things that are happening in our space, right, around contact tracing, uh, medical screeners, uh, the planning that goes along with getting people back to work, which is really, I think, a lot of our focus now, going back to the office and uh, doing it in a, in a safe and efficient manager ma manner that uh, everyone can really be aligned with. So that's, that's what it's done for my team. Thanks, Alan. So welcome, welcome to the group, Gary. Uh, so Gary is the uh, CIO for City of Atlanta. Um, we're gifted to have two folks on the board who are either CISOs or have uh, a lot of security in their background. So Joseph uh, Dyer is a Chief Information Security Officer, and I, Gary, as I understand you, you head up the CISO Council within Zoom as well as your Deputy CIO role. So some of these questions will will take towards the uh, the threats as well as the opportunities. So so Gary, I'm going to throw it over to you, uh, leading the City of Atlanta. Uh, same same sort of question there. How, how did you uh, keep your team engaged and innovative during this pandemic? Gary Brantley, that is. There's two Gary, sorry. <laughs> yeah, not, not a problem. This, this really, this whole pandemic really started to um, allow the soft skill aspect to really come out. Um, it, it became less about technology and more about people. And so uh, th this pandemic was a little bit different. We, we, we got really creative on, on the people side, right? We got creative. Um, just around engagement and knowing when to end the day, when to stop the day. Uh, our engagement with the business has, has grown tremendously because of the reliance on it. And I heard you all say in the other, uh, I think in the other panel, we are the business. That is absolutely correct. That's something I've been advocating a long time. I'm not sure who started that, that whole saying, but um, we've been fighting extremely hard to, to change that narrative. And so, uh, one of the things that 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 has been really uh, focused on, not only with with my department, but with the with the city of Atlanta in general, is, is just around making sure our our team our teammates are in the right mindset to conduct the business that they need to conduct. And so we've just really gotten creative around how we interact with them, what we say when we talk about work, when we don't talk about work, uh, more engagement around family. Uh, I think family time, really showing them that, that their family can be a part of the cause if, if necessary, not jumping and getting upset when a, 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 their child may jump on the screen and say, hey, can you help me with, get, get, can we get some food? What do we need to eat? Just um, being a lot more uh, receptive, open-minded, and in touch with our staff. So that's, um, that's a good point. We can stay on this for a long time. Uh, I'm just going to swing it over to the other Gary. I, I can't imagine what it would be like to work with inside Zoom, you know, during this time. Uh, it must be pretty exciting, and I, I'm not sure how you balance and know uh, when you're on, when you're off. A company like Zoom, when uh, you know, uh, professionals, companies, uh, families, uh, yoga groups, whatever, social hours, it's going on seven by twenty-four. So, Gary, can you touch on some of the same points um, that uh, that Gary did relative to? Uh, how to manage that workforce and keep them engaged during the pandemic. So you said something interesting at the beginning. How do you manage on and off? As soon as we have an off day, I'll let you know. But but at the end of the day, no, it, but that's what happened at the beginning, right? When the pandemic hit, the need to help schools uh, with e-learning and the need to help telemedicine get get off and the need to, to, to start 
telemedicine in a much serious way. Um, the need to keep companies connected and collaborative through something that was easy to install and, and required almost no training to support or to use uh, was huge. And so uh, we all jumped in. No matter where you were inside of Zoom, you were working with clients. And so I've worked with clients all over the world to help them put in things uh, like Zoom and, and our chat systems and our voice systems in order to help people to stay collaborative. But it was, as you can probably tell, it was a 24 by seven journey. Um, we worked days, weekends. Um, our clients worked that way. You have to understand that, you know, we, the last panel talked about the CIO and in the last four months, the CIO has changed a lot. Um, we become part of the business. The business sometimes doesn't understand about stopping on Friday night and it doesn't, and it runs through the weekend. I came from the financial industry uh, most recently and it was, there was no Friday different than Thursday and things like that. And so um, I think the success with Zoom is that we all pull together uh, as a team and our goal was help clients. Right. Um, we deliver happiness. That's Eric's logo. And it really was about work to whatever it takes to make sure that the clients and even people can get back connected with their families, that people can start collaborating. Businesses can start collaborating together uh, to the point where even there were times where I was training employees. Companies would call me up and say, can you, can you just get on the call with our, our employees and train them on how to use Zoom? And it's a very easy product to use. So it doesn't take a lot of training. So um, I think at the beginning there, it probably was a little crazy. I don't come from the vendor side, as you know. Uh, my background has mostly been in financial services. And so when I started with Zoom in December, it was a normal company and it got, it, it went pandemic crazy like everything else, but it did fill that gap to help people. And uh, we're very proud of that. So Gary, I'm going to stay, stay with you because you mentioned your, your background in the, in the big banks, right? Uh, the cities, the JP Morgan Chases. You, you work in some really huge IT shops, billion dollar budgets, right? So now you're in this uh, hot upstart technology company. So what, what are some of the other, um, I'll say technology shifts that you're seeing? You know, it's not just the, obviously the video is the obvious one, let's not go there, but what other technology shifts um, are you seeing that are now more prevalent and uh, enabled by this? So, I mean, look, we'll put them all under collaboration, right? We're seeing people shift to, yes, new video. We'll leave that one on the side, that's obvious. But we're seeing a lot of people, I said it in my first part with Hunter is, we're seeing a lot of people on voice. Um, that traditional phone, which is can't be sanitized very well, that hardware device that's there, we're seeing a lot of companies decide, I can't guarantee that I can get that clean every night. And the employees are, I can't guarantee that it's clean, I'm not gonna use it. And so what we've seen is things like telephones going away for a lack of other like voice over IP. We've seen integration with more chat systems. Um, I am seeing companies put video basically everywhere now, uh, but not the video that we all grew up with. Uh, most of us have, you know, we probably can name some of the larger video and phone shops that we came from. And, uh, you know, come on, we're all CIOs. At one time, it's like to put a video conference over in that room, we'll see you in six months. Tape goes up, people come in. Now today it hangs on the wall like a picture. Now today we can move your phone into your desktop with a day's training and tomorrow you'll have the same phone number but you'll be using it in a much different way. And that phone number will follow you home. Today, we're seeing people where they're actually buying the employees, the parts that they touch, keyboards and things like that. And they're allowing the employees to own that device. So yes, I do come to work. And yes, I will find a seat, but there'll be no phone at that seat and there'll be no keyboard at that seat. See, the phone is built in and the keyboard I brought and I cleaned it last night at home. And so we're seeing a shift in some of these very common uh, collaboration tools. I think the next shift we're seeing is everybody wants them to be frictionless and easy. You see, they keep relaying it back to, well, I can do that on this personal device very quickly, and I can do it on this personal application. And so I think what has happened is the days where the somebody would call the CIO and say, why does it take me, you know, six weeks to get a, a, a Mac a laptop when I can go across the street to Grand Central and get it right now? Right? But now we're seeing, why does it take me all this time to use this tool when the tool that's compatible in the personal world works so much better? And so I think we're- Thank, thank you, Gary. Those are, those are really good additional examples of, of technology shifts. So let's, as the technology shifts, uh, I'm guessing the threats do as well. So, so Joseph, I've been waiting to call on you, Joe Dyer. Um, you know, the technology shifted, the opportunities are great. 
uh, to disrupt. Now, what about the new threats? What, what are you seeing, Joe Dyer, as far as that, that's concerned, new, new threats out there? Sure. Th thanks, Bill. And, and again, there's no shortage of those threats as they were, have been already large as it relates to, you know, dealing with um, your external and internal threats from that perspective. So I think the real challenge uh, that we've actually seen is that in addition to some of the threats that we currently already see within an organization, we have this very dramatic, this forced approach by which we're now changing the entire dynamics of how an organization may operate. Uh, and, that, and that means particularly with covert, um, as it was expressed before, you know, we no longer have a workforce that's you know, reporting into an office. So that's propagating outside of what we would typically consider our boundaries, you know, inside of our networks. And we're pushing large pieces of the organization outside. And that really means them working from home. So what does that mean? Uh, you know, everything from the physical security, um, you know, accessibility to specific information, um, the capability to be able to engage with clients uh, that may be interconnected in your network. And now we have to reach back out to them. Uh, and, you know, being able to implement and, and follow the pace of technology and implement good, good security practice is a risk, you know, all in itself. So just from the home itself, even from the threat side, we've seen an increase in the overall even phishing campaigns uh, that's being sent out targeted at home users. Uh, so, you know, educating and staying in constant uh, communication with them through, you know, mediums that we use today as an extreme important uh, factor in that. And one thing I will bring to, which may not just come to uh, light at the beginning, but I see one of the biggest threats that most companies are facing now is enabling the leadership technologies and se uh, security companies to really go back and reassess where the threats and where the security is. Because I think we move so fast in many cases that reassessment wouldn't done, uh, wasn't completed and the whole dynamics of security change. So I, I would suggest that we, we in turn, you know, from a business perspective, as we transition into these new business practices and strategies, that's one of the real places you want to start um, is really taking a look at what that strategy looks like and, and go away from what's now, right? Go to where we need to go and then how long is going to take us to get there. Um, but again, I think that's where one of the main threats is, is ensuring that the organization is understanding and reassessing where the real threats are and then really focusing down on the endpoint um, and the user behavior and what's happening there on the end device because that's where the real threat is uh, in today's security posture and environment. Thanks a lot, Joe. So Alan, I'm gonna come back to you now. I think knowing what I know about Randstad, um, these concerns right around the, uh, the virtual workforce is very much part of your, um, by your company's uh, play in the market and then even the, maybe the privacy aspect. So there's gotta be some security privacy aspects that spill into your job. I'm guessing you could give us a perspective on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, for, for us, the, the journey, and, and I just saw Manisha's uh, question about scaling out uh, security. So it kind of ties in here. We, um, we found that both our clients and ourselves internally were dealing with the same challenge and it was around the comfort level of having people work from home. And we, right at the beginning, built a, a whole concept around what that desktop looks like at home compared to what they were using at the office and really made sure it was secure from both the standpoint of what we're looking at but our clients. And then we built out uh, a solution that we could take to our clients and say, all right, I know m many IT departments were struggling with this. We came to them with a full cloud-based uh, solution so that our people that were working for the client, they could get comfortable work going home and having access to all the same systems that they did before. You know, new products have spun out from this around just tracking, uh, you know, monitoring that before was not as critical and crucial to understand exactly what happened on that computer every minute of the day. Now there's, there's solutions that we're using that can really track down to the, the keyboard level and, and we actually are using those where historically that was just not something we would provide our clients, but, uh, but now it's almost become an expectation with some of them, uh, especially going back to Gary on, on the bank, banking side. Um, that, that is a, a comfort level that we were able to kind of overcome by giving them uh, you know, validation that, they, that we would be doing those things and, and have real, real visibility. And it's, it's not somebody's, uh, kid, somebody's kids uh, at home touching their computer and touching their uh, valuable sensitive information. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, I think uh, we did get that question coming in from Manish to address scalability. 
Um, you know, we, we, we've been hit with uh, unusual volumes. I'm sure Gary could talk uh, ad nauseum about the, the scale, scale of Zoom. And I, you know, some of us have witnessed some of the, maybe Cisco WebEx had more issues than Zoom, certainly in my experience, until they were able to scale out 5X data centers, whatever they had to do. So I think we all have our personal story. Uh, me at NCR, I have a personal story. We had our digital banking business, large volumes that hit in the second week in April around the stimulus checks, you know, that the federal government issued. And so all the online banking, mobile banking hit all at once. And you could tell which companies were scale, had scale built into their design and which ones didn't because many, many large banks had outages uh, that second week of, of April. So uh, to, to that point, uh, who on the panel uh, wants to give an example maybe of uh, building in scalability or designing for scalability that, that turned out to be uh, uh, a good thing for you during, during this time. Does anybody have a personal story to share there? Listen, I, I can start. This is, this is Gary. Of course, the, the, the city is extremely complex, right? And so when we were talking a little bit about security, um, you know, I have a different approach to it. I think the majority of our users were, were going home and working at home anyway. This just gave us an opportunity to really shore up areas uh, from, a secu from the security side of things that we really uh, couldn't find the money and, and, and allow um, you know, other areas of the business to, to put an investment in. And so what I mean by that is typically a lot of our, our, our users um, you know, have mobile devices and they were working from home uh, you know, after work, after five o'clock. I think the difference is they were coming back in and what we're seeing different now is they were coming back in for a checkpoint for, for, for eight to five. So we were dealing with, in my opinion, home users anyway. Um, and so what, what this has allowed us to do is really, uh, uh, you know, scale out more flexibility um, as it relates to what our, our environment and network can do. What I mean by that is just really being able to secure um, outside of our network, being able to patch outside of our network, uh, being able to run scans outside of our network with all of these different employees sitting in different environments, I believe really allowed us to, to take that extra step ahead. And so when, when you start talking about the scalability that took place around just our, our infrastructure and, our, and being able to provide a, a, a vast array of different options for security, I think that's one area that we were really able to, to make a lot of headway in extremely quickly. So, so Gary, uh, Sorrentino, we, we all are just really curious, like, like how, much, how much did you have to scale out for Zoom to keep up you know, with the volume increase over the past four months? Is there anything you can share with us publicly in terms of sure. um, that multiplier? Yeah, so Zoom was built as a cloud-based application built on being highly scalable. And I think it really did prove the fact that build an application cloud-based the right way in a highly scalable mode, it works. Uh, we actually went from uh, 10,000 users in like uh, January to 30X by the time. And that's public number. So I'm not telling. We went from uh, 10,000 to 200,000 in April and then added, I'm sorry, 10 million to 200 million to 300 million in a month. And so it's a 30X increase along the way there, uh, but built a uh, web-based uh, from the ground up, a cloud-based uh, in a highly scalable model. So we can just keep turning up servers and add new data centers uh, globally. Plus we have a global model. So uh, for companies that want to use the full scale of our, I believe it's 19 locations around the world. Again, you know, we can always play the one, one side of the world is sleeping so we can put volume there and the other side of the world is sleeping so we can play east and west and, and uh, north and south there. But if, you know, if you write the application the correct way, it, it will scale and we really did prove that it can. Uh, we didn't have a knock on something, uh, an outage with any of the, the uh, volume increases. Thanks, thanks. We were all, we were all curious about that, just how much, so, so uh, three, 300X, right? 30x right 30 30x right so i do add another zero <laughs> yeah so it's all well that's okay we'll take the 300 okay <laughs> yeah. we'll get there someday right yeah no that's awesome so um like to hear like on on our level the professional level of the c-suite um how your interaction has changed like personally at our company we do a daily stand-up call now 9 30 every morning we're on the camera looking at each other it's, it's, it's pretty jovial just how's everybody doing uh, just just go around the table real quick. I'd like to hear like how, how your interaction with the C-suite has changed. And I, I got to believe that it has. Can, can you share some of that with us? Let's start with you, uh, 
Joseph, Joseph Dyer, let's start with you. Sure, no problem. Yeah, I, I think you just basically mentioned it that, you know, we engage a lot more in the expectation of, you know, doing these type of, of conferences uh, and, and doing one-on-one. -on -one. We, you know, from the teams, we had already, you know, practiced engaging uh, in those type of practices. We, we have team meetings and, you know, we engage in those on, on a periodic basis, whether it's daily or weekly. But I think what we're finding now is, is an expansion into that uh, that's really going out to, you know, executive leadership by which they're also now uh, you know, planning uh, more frequent, um, you know, sessions, uh, you know, over uh, video conferencing. And that, that expands outbound as well, right, to where, you know, there was expectation you used to pick up the telephone before you call someone. I, I think the engagements now, although we don't have that face-to-face, -face, um, you know, interactivity, the idea that more people now are using videos because the platforms have been built out, um, it adds a lot of synergy. So, so I think, you know, it's probably similar to what most people are doing, and that is we are, you know, scheduling these in and, and creating more of these type of face-to-face uh, -face over video type of sessions, which have been, you know, proven to be very effective. So, so Gary Brantley, like, how, how has your interaction changed now with the city of Atlanta? I'm, I'm guessing, you know, the mayor, for example, you've got to have some, some pretty consistent dialogue and you know, on, on down the line there, right? How is that different now working virtual in, in this pandemic era? Yeah, the communication has increased probably uh, 30x. <laughs> that was just a joke. But um, no, really, we, we talk a lot more. Um, I think the engagement and the reliance on technology um, in this uh, pandemic has allowed for that to happen. Uh, we find ourselves in, in conversations that we weren't normally in. And so I think that that is really where we, we, have, start, we have started to see things really turn. I think um, they're looking to us for more opportunity uh, strategically around just efficiencies. And the one thing, the, the last thing I'll say is we talk, uh, we have our daily calls, but what, I, what I'm finding is that we're a lot more efficient on video. Uh, we wanna get we want to get in, get out. Um, I feel like uh, we're more timely as it relates to just the start and the ending of, of meetings. And so those are some of the things that have changed uh, uh, with, our, with the city of Atlanta. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. Alan Stokowski, big global company. Um, how, how do you interact now with the C-suite and how do you do it differently? An advice for the other CIOs on the call? Yeah, I guess, I guess what I would say, similar to, to the, what, what's happened uh, in the other organizations, I, I think what, what I like to uh, pride ourselves on is we've brought Agile to the business um, and, and you know, now all of our business leaders and down below all their teams do stand-ups and Set, uh, set goals per day versus what used to be once a week meetings. Um, so I'm, I'm quite proud of that and setting up that framework. Um, I think the other part for us has been at this stage in the game, we've decided we're gonna wait until January until we really start, uh, let's say, moving people back into the office uh, uh, more, more as, a, as a requirement. And based on that, we said, all right, this, since this is gonna last, we know another four months at least, we need to change some of the, the ways we work. And, and it's, it's been everything from the, the social gatherings that we've changed the whole approach as to how we meet socially, but also bringing ourselves out to our company personally, which before didn't happen as much actually uh, as to introducing my family, my kids, my dog, you know, to, to the company. We've, we've made it a, a real challenge for each of us to just go out there and, and be vulnerable and making sure that the, that our company sees us as, you know, people that are working just like them, struggling with working from home with families and, and pets and everything else. And I think that's helped our engagement tremendously across the company. So that's, that's one of the things we've uh, really focused on more recently as we've, we've really said this is going to continue for a while. Thanks. So la last question, I'm going to go around quick on this one. I think we have probably five minutes left. So I'm going to stay with you, Alan, uh, for efficiency here. And so, so sort of the last question, closing, closing comments around what's, what's going to stay? In other words, we have it now under the pandemic, and it's going to stay. It's the new norm. What's the one thing do you think from, from our leadership perspective that we're going to continue to do uh, that we're doing now and keep, keep it carrying going forward? I'll, I'll take the easy one here. I, I don't think we're ever going to be uh, back fully in the office. I think this work from home adoption and acceptance is now within the culture of every company. And I believe that's going to just continue. I don't see uh, myself ever being five days a week back in the office personally. So that uh, and then the travel, which 
I don't mind having less travel. So that's, that's uh, the other bright spot. So thank you very much, uh, Alan. J J Joe Dyer, how, how about you? And that could be, a, could be a security threat that you think is new and ongoing, or it could just be the same question. Take it either way you want. Sure. I, know, I, think, I think I can you know, split it in the middle here in that I think it will be continued shift uh, you know, to cloud-based type of solutions for organizations or business applications, tools, and from security. Uh, so from a security perspective, I think the ideals are really uh, looking at, you know, how do I now get more creative and adopt uh, to those type of tools and implementing, you know, automation and, and um, you know, orchestration and, and embedding AI in that uh, so that we can really continue to focus, you know, on a, on a very diverse environment of data by which we're not used to, um, you know, managing it in, in that way, right, or the lack of visibility into it. So I, so I think that continued uh, trend uh, will definitely be expedited uh, as we move forward. Thanks, Joe. So Gary, Gary, what's the one thing that your team has started up to do now, uh, working from home, that you're going to you're going to for certain see it going forward in the new norm? Which, which Gary? Gary. <laughs> Gary Brantley. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I'm 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 really looking forward to a decrease in Atlanta traffic. I, I'll keep it light, right? I think that. We're going to see some incredible changes as it relates to our ability to get to the office a lot sooner and leave with a lot less congestion as we move outside of the city, which is which in turn is going to provide us with some options. Uh, technically, I, I also feel like we're going to continue to see uh, rapid adoption, just uh, of, of, of technologies to really help us through this. Gary, we're get, you're going to get a lot of high fives from all of us here in Atlanta if you can keep the traffic off the highways. So Gary Sorrentino, um, how would you take that one? What do you see as uh, the new norm that's definitely going to be with us forever? So, so here's what I hope is. I hope that we don't stop innovating. I hope that we're going to get to a level where innovation is going to stay front and center. Um, we are going to look for rapid adoption, as uh, the other Gary said. And I hope that the bond that has been built between business and technology doesn't get lost. That dependency stays with us because as partners, we can, we can achieve miracles, right? If we just stay together and solve problems together. Okay. I want to thank the panel. Uh, this has been uh, a really outstanding dialogue. Um, we have a few minutes left. I don't know if there's any questions coming in. Uh, is there anybody else that wants to make a comment? Because I'm, I'm pretty much at the end of my questions. Hey, Bill, and, great uh, job. Gary, we'll turn Gary, it over to Hunter. Gary Allen, great job. Uh, Bill, great job. Hey, just kind of like a final, like little quick comment on in technology t now, most exciting, most challenging, most uh, biggest opportunity for a tech leader at this point in uh, our industry. Alan, you want to go first? You're on mute. Sorry, the, the biggest opportunity for us? Yeah, most I, I think, exciting, biggest opportunity. Yeah, I, for, for me, it's, it's really um, the partnership with the business and IT being core to, to driving new product strategy. Um, and, and I think the acceptance of that uh, has, has really changed. And it's, it's really a huge opportunity to, to take what's become now common through the pandemic and making, it, uh, making sure that it doesn't uh, lose a focus. Excellent, brilliant, thanks. Joe? Yeah, I think uh, one of the best opportunities here would be the re-engagement with the customer or the client. Uh, it's a great time now to step in and be an advisor or to really understand, you know, what the business needs are and have it to adopt and or, you know, start looking at the, the continued innovation uh, components to what's involved in that. Excellent. So, you know, Gary? Gary Brantley? Yeah, I think we I think we have an opportunity to deliver. I think we're at the forefront. Um, it's good to be. We'll continue to be at the table. I do believe that. If if many weren't there before, I am sure they're there now. But I think once we get there, um, and we have to deliver. And so I think it's an opportunity to continue to take on more more pressure, like we've always done. Uh, but at, at the visibility of it is just a little bit higher. Agreed. Thanks, Gary. Gary asked. So I think we always talked about landing the plane and being able to make big changes. The plane is never going to get any closer to the ground. And so I think at this time, it's thinking about the impossible, thinking about those things that we thought about that we couldn't do unless X happened. Well, X happened. 
So let's take advantage of um, thinking about the impossible and making those um, record-breaking changes. Thanks, Gary. Brilliant. Bill, final final word. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Hunter. I think for me, it's just the speed of the digital transformation. I think I think all of us had planned for it. We had envisioned it. We built DR capacity plans around it, but we never really thought it would be 100. percent And then we just flipped the switch like the second week in March. So the speed the speed at which we're driving the change and the speed at which we're scaling out the digital transformation that that's that's what I think it is, Hunter. Excellent, Bill. Great job. Great panel, folks. Hopefully you can stay with us. We've got one more quick session and then uh, the recognition program at the very end. Next up, Tony Lang. Tony, take it away. Thank you, Hannah. I really appreciate it. And before we kick off our panel, your team asked me to put up a poll. So um, there's a poll that's about to appear. And then if my panel could all um, start their videos and get themselves off mute while everyone's doing this innovation survey, uh, that's where we'll kick off. And let me just start uh, by saying the following. What we've heard from a lot of these top CIOs this afternoon is about speed and the change. And things have changed in three big areas. We've heard about the technology change. Tech has saved companies. Digital transformation, huge impact. The thing above that that was also mentioned is the corporate strategy change. The CIO, the CDO is now, to a large extent, helping to drive the entire corporate strategy, shifting from you know, product, uh, I mean, from, from projects into entire product focuses, and, and that is changing the organizations. The third dimension is what I call the people strategy, and there's an enormous change in, in how people lead, how executives lead, and we heard it you know, vulnerability, empathy, top-down approaches aren't really working. But a big element of that that's driven by COVID, but also by, you know, the, the social changes that everybody has been experiencing is diversity and inclusion, DNI. Many executives are calling it inclusion and diversity because inclusion is seen as hugely important. And that's what this panel is going to talk about. And what I want to do is ask four major questions to the team. You know, who's driving it? How do you modify or change expectations? What do you do to bring people in? How do you ensure success when people join? That's the inclusion. And what are you doing personally? So let me start by asking my panelists to introduce themselves and tackle question one. Who is driving the DNI strategy in your organization? And Jackie, let's start with you. Thank you, Tony. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me here and great opening. I am Vice President of Sales for Dell Technologies and looking forward to a very lively conversation. So great question, who's driving the diversity and inclusion strategy? So I want to say it is a collaborative effort. We've got a diversity and inclusion team, of course, but as a business leader, it's really important to know that diversity and inclusion is a business imperative. We really look at it that way. And we like to always look at the companies we admire, the world's most admired companies. And, and just like our company, 74% of the top companies say that the business leaders have to drive it. So we're doing the same thing. Change happens when it's measured. We know things get done. And so business leaders are driving it with the collaboration of our diversity. Is there a push from the very top, from the board of directors as well? I would say yes. It is, it's a company culture imperative, and it has to come from the very top. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Jason James, over to you. Hi, my name is Jason James. I'm CEO of NetHealth. We're a software company that focuses on the continuum of healthcare, and that's everything from the hospice, uh, the hospital to the home to hospice. Um, you know, when you talk about diversity and inclusion strategies, uh, you know, much like Jackie said, they have to start at the top. It's everybody's job. It's become table stakes. You know, what you're doing is creating not only a place where other people want to work, but a place where you want to work, right? And, you know, it, it bringing more people to the table, bringing people that represent who we are as society, 
gets us closer to a place for me that I want to work at. And so we do discuss it uh, in our executive leadership meetings. We discuss it uh, in board meetings. The idea is um, we want to be proud of what we're doing, right? We want to build a culture that, yeah, it, it may be a tech company, but there's a lot more than the technology. You know, our entire motto is we're reuniting caregivers where they're calling. And in a way, we're reuniting each other with each other, right? And breaking down those barriers and having uh, people have not only a stake at the table, but equity. Great. Thanks, Kathy Orish. What do you have to say about this? You and Joe are both headhunters. We'll start with you. And, and tell me, how is it experienced from your perspective with your clients? Who's driving this? Great. So I'm with Andros Berenson, one of the global executive search firms, and we're doing it within our firm. And like everyone else, it's at the top with the CEO and our global board on a global scale. But then what we're doing is also taking it to our clients. And when we take it to our clients, we're working within, I'll call it the hiring pillar within DNI. So how do they hire better? And then onboarding those, those candidates and making sure they're included. And so we're working with the business executives and HR and diversity officers that have those as the imperative. But the organizations themselves, it's coming from the top. Great, wonderful, Joe? Yeah, this is Joe Gross, I agree. Um, I'm the president of CIO Partners. As, as Tony mentioned, we are an executive search firm. And, um, you know, I think we're seeing you know, I'm really going to comment on what our clients are doing. And we have an opportunity to interview kind of across the organization when we're engaged. And, um, you know, the we work on everything from, you know, small startup, midsize, all the way up to global Fortune 500. And, the, you know, in the large global companies, they're identifying these roles at a VP level. Um, they're, uh, you know, VP, C level, at the very least, manager and director. Um, Small, mid-sized companies are really pointing toward HR. Um, and I think you'll see a lot of times the, the rest of the senior leadership team in those mid-sized companies are looking to HR uh, for help with it. Um, but when you talk about driving, I'm, I, you know, I think you really think about two lanes. There's driving vision and there's driving, ex uh, there's driving execution, right? So the vision, I think everybody mentioned it, it's gotta come from the top, and it's be a top-down vision, and it's one that's shared across the organization then you hire the right folks to actually execute it. And uh, I think when we see it work well, it's when, when I do do those interviews across an organization and it doesn't just come from the top, it comes out in every interview across every functional area in, in and outside of IT. Right. When that happens, then we know it's a good, probably a good merger between the execution and the vision. That's great, thank you so much. So let's shift now to sort of the question number two, which is bringing people into the organization. And we're gonna talk about the more senior levels. Most organizations are starting to re recruit from campus and from, and you know, it's really top to bottom. But let's talk a little bit about the more senior executives. And the question is, do you modify expectations? Should you modify expectations? If you modify expectations, to people who are being hired think of themselves as tokens? Or do you need to modify expectations because perhaps you know, a black candidate may not have had the finances, the money, or the time to dedicate themselves to their studies, like somebody from a more privileged background? This is kind of a complicated area, and I would love to have everybody's perspective in how do you balance this to make sure that you're doing a really great job? And then the next question will be inclusion. So don't talk about inclusion yet. Jackie, we'll start with you again. Good question. I would say you don't modify expectations. And here's why. A lot of studies have been done. We've been looking at it too, is that you just want an equitable playing field. So it's really looking at if you keep doing the same things over and over again, you'll keep getting the same results. So what do you do? You have to change your processes. So I'll start, first of all, with looking at how you attract talent. And if you keep going to the same well, you get the same results. So what we're looking at doing in other places too, I think there's a really good article in Fast Company. And it says, for example, top companies are not looking at historically black colleges and Hispanic serving institutions. And they graduate 22% uh, 
of um, African Americans from HBCUs. So a lot of top talent there that's being overlooked. So now it's allowing us to have a different lens. You don't, it's great talent. Don't lower any standards. No one wants a handout. It's yep. really giving me an equal opportunity. So it's representation, uh, equal opportunity, and giving them the skills to, we'll talk about that next question, to transfer in and be prepared to feel like a sense of belonging. So I say you have to look at the hiring practices, Tony. So when I say hire, are the questions biased questions? Can you start to use technology, artificial intelligence to take some of the biases out? We're looking at doing um, programs such as anonymizing um, just the resumes and applications, taking the names out, trying to look at every possible way to make it anonymous so everyone has a fair chance. So no one's asking, again, to, to change a process but what we're also doing, which is exciting for us, we're looking at community colleges that we didn't look at before. We have great talent. And we know that everyone may not have the money, but yet they're still wonderful. They're talented. They're awesome. But giving everyone a fair chance without lowering standards, but just opening up the net to cast it wider. Wonderful. Thank you so much. JJ, how do you do it? Yeah, I mean, let's, let's start by addressing the elephant in the room. Often companies say they want to hire for cultural fit. Here's the problem with that. When you hire for cultural fit, everybody looks like you. Everybody sounds like you. Everybody has the same background as you. You can't do that. Like Jackie said, there, there are great opportunities to go out. You know, we're doing the same thing. How do, you know, we used to recruit a lot at Georgia Tech or CMU. Why even look at certain roles to have a college degree, right? There's a lot of talent that has the work ethic, but maybe not the means to actually go to school. And especially when you start talking about how expensive higher education has gotten now. So we have a lot of jobs that we've removed any kind of requirement for college education. Uh, to Jackie's point, you have to remove the bias from the hiring process. So if you anonymize and you take out the names, it removes the potential for sexism. You don't know if it's a man or a woman. Uh, the potential for racism. You don't know if it's a person of color. If, you know, for Atlanta, granted, you know, Gary talked about it earlier, uh, traffic's not an issue in Atlanta like it once was, but you could remove the address and therefore you don't have location bias. Because in that sense, somebody might say, well, JJ lives in Vinings. He wouldn't take a job up in Alpharetta, which under normal circumstances would be an hour and a half away. Well, let's remove that. Let's give the applicant a chance to make that call, right? And so this idea is you are looking at data. So if you only focus on the last few years and the actual work someone's done, what you find is in the process, you get a lot more diverse candidates making it through to the final round. And again, the hope is you're not hiring for culture, you're hiring for uh, hiring for means to change your culture. Great, thank you so much. Kathy, tell us how you're operationalizing this with your clients. Good, I've been doing um, diversity and heading our diversity practice and I've been doing diversity recruiting for probably 15, 20 years and I've, collected a lot of best practices and everybody's touched on it. You need to set up the process to reduce the unconscious bias. And even if you anonymize that resume, they still walk into the room after that piece of paper. So you have to make sure you, you are minimizing that. The biggest thing that I've learned from my clients is if you set up the list of competencies, what do we need in this job? And like everybody has said, you don't change the spec or reduce your standards. However, to cast a wider net, you can um, look for people with different titles, with lack of degree, whatever it might be, so that you get more people in there. But then make sure you're interviewing to those competencies, not is this someone like me? An example I have, um, one of my clients is Stanford University. I did the CIO search and head of infrastructure and a couple others, and all four were diversity hires. And for the head of infrastructure, that it's a highly technical group, as you guys might know, Sun came out of this group, very technical in the network infrastructure. And it was hard to get diversity. We ended up having one candidate that didn't have a degree. And we're talking Stanford University, so they do have an education bias there. 
And they said, well, no, the leadership, the complete leader that we talked about earlier on this was more important and the technical credentials. And they ended up hiring an Asian woman with no degree into Stanford. But it's because we interviewed around the competencies. What are the check marks that they need to do? And it doesn't need to look like everyone else. So that's the one thing. I've got another one. Do you want me to add in one other thing or come back to it? Well, let's go. We've got a lot of ground, Kathy. I will 100% give you an opportunity to talk a little more on this. And because I want to really cover some inclusion stuff. And I think you're starting to touch on the inclusion side of it. So Joe, over to you quickly before we then move on to the inclusion side of things. Sure. Yes. Thank you. I think, um, Jackie, I think you nailed it, right? Casting the net and adjusting process to increase your exposure. And um, you know, you're hired as a search firm, from a search firm's perspective, you're hired to pr provide the most qualified candidate, and you should. Uh, but th as a search firm, do you question yourself and say, how do we increase the diversity in our slates of candidates without sacrificing quality? And there is, a, you know, and that's not saying that a diverse slate is less qualified. It's more increasing awareness. So as search firms, do we publicly announce what we're working on? I know that we all don't do it. I know it's happening more often. Um, there's nothing to be afraid of. The only thing that you are afraid of in those situations are it's very tedious and consuming because the response is bigger, but you're reaching a bigger segment of the population. And, and by doing so, it increases your numbers, you're, you're casting a wider net. Um, you know, and I think that's something, something that search firms should focus on when they're partnered and coach their, their clients when they can. Absolutely, well done, well spoken. Okay, so now the interesting part, you know, how do you make sure that people are included appropriately, you know, and the ERG programs and, you know, how do you kind of know people? How do you invest and sponsor them? How do you give them access and visibility? How do you mentor and- Hello, and can you guys hear me okay? Get them to be successful. Hi, how are you? Well, so um, Jackie, we'll start with you. This is the inclusion question. Absolutely. Oh, it's a lot right there to unpack. So I'm going to start with a couple of levels. Let's say that we're bringing in entry-level employees. And it's so important when you bring those employees in. Some of them, if we're looking at you know, the reimagining, how we bring them in, some of them may be first-generation college students um, or graduates. And so you, we want to make sure they are plugged into an employee resource group. So there is a sense of belonging. That's extremely important because we can bring employees of diverse backgrounds in but we've got to retain them. And that's one key we found is making sure they feel like they belong. And as you start to look and, and higher, higher up, it's important um, to have an included environment where people feel like they have a voice. And we found that sponsorship, advocacy, absolutely imperative um, to retaining top talent. You also want to make sure that you have a mentoring program that's robust at every single level. The mentoring, an ally, advocacy, and then promotion, career advancement, and you know, investing in the employees at every part of the spectrum. So very important to not only developing, hiring, and retaining the employees. So again, I can't emphasize a res employee resource group, having managers and having allies, that's key because people of color sometimes feel like they are not getting the same type of opportunity because they don't have someone who's going to advocate for them when they're not in the room. Great. JJ? Yeah, exactly what Jackie said. One of the things we also as leaders have to make sure is that often we're not the strongest voice in the room. You know, sometimes our voice can cover up others. You know, it's our job to, to reach out to those that report into us, no matter what level they are, to give them opportunities, to give them an opportunity to present, even if it's in just a departmental meeting, right? The idea is we want people to have a voice. We want them to have a chance. We want them to have an opportunity. And I, I believe in, in, in mentorship, right? I've been running a, a mentorship program within my own organization for years. And so what we've done is try to spread that outside of my organization right to give people an opportunity to help advance their career but as they advance their career help them become a bigger voice within the organization great thanks kathy 
Ivan, do you, do you, how do you consult with your clients on this? Yeah, so I look at it as diversity, equity, and in inclusion, DEI. And one of the things that I've learned is that women and people of color underrepresent themselves um, in, in, in some cases. A woman CIO once, when I asked her how many direct report, how many reports do you have? She said, I have five direct reports. So I said, time out, how many are on their teams? 10, how many contractors? 50. So she led a team of 100, but said five. And that gives you an idea of how they underrepresent. But what you'll find is people do that continually, that they'll, you know, they've learned to be humble, hide themselves and, and kind of downplay what they've been doing. And I've run into that on candidates. Well, that comes into play when it comes into hiring and then also promotions. So if you think about it, a white male might get promoted every 24 months, but a diverse candidate every 36, 48 months. And so one major tech company, what they did through their women's ERG was let them know that this is about promotions and they needed to step up and promote themselves at, the, at an equal footing. And after they did that, they had equal level of promotions of women and men. One year they forgot to send out that reminder and they went back to the lower levels. So it's thinking about how are people communicating and promoting themselves and because the self-promotion, they may be downplaying what they're capable of doing. Got it, Joe? Yeah, well said, Catherine. I, I agree with that for sure. Um, I think the other piece on, on helping to coach clients is, you know, a lot of times if we're kicking off an engagement or a search and, you know, say we're doing a CIO search, um, somewhere in the conversation or at the end, there's an, oh, by the way, we want a diverse slate of candidates. Well, okay, great. Um, what can you share with us regarding your inclusion program and what your strategy is so that we can sell your opportunity appropriately? And sometimes I get back crickets, right? Other times, it, because what are they trying to do? Maybe they're just a splash with a hire in a certain area. But sometimes there is something out there that they can share with us. Maybe they're supporting diverse organizations, part of their, their social responsibility program, what, what have you. But give us something to um, to be able to sell the opportunity to the candidates because they have choices. I, you know, they, I think some companies think that these, these candidates don't have choices. They absolutely do. Um, so how do you make them your choice? Right. And I think that's where it's important to understand where's the push coming from. It's much more authentic if it's being driven by the board and they're embraced by the senior leadership team and their measures and methodologies and they've created, you know, employee resource groups and, and, and everything else. I think that, that enables that opportunity to work well. So here's the question that's kind of rubber meets the road. I wanna know what you're doing. So, so this is a question of, you know, how, what are the best practices you are personally adopting to make sure this works? And let me kind of give you, you know, a couple of best practices that I advise certain people to focus on. And one is kind of demonstrate vulnerability and empathy. Share about yourself. Get to know other people's stories. You know, I think the whole George Floyd thing kind of opened up that window, but it needs to stay open. And then challenge personal your own personal assumptions adopt a learning orientation make space in your teams for diverse perspectives encourage participation make sure you hear the voices celebrate different opinions give credit where it's due as jackie mentioned be intentional about mentoring people and and have your team and your in your, yourself set little individual goals about you know how am I going to stand up for what's right? How am I going to recognize? How am I going to hear those voices? You know, so those are some of the things that, that, you know, that, that I'm attempting to do in my small teams. But I would love to hear from all of you, uh, Jackie and Jason in particular, as to what you are personally doing, and then Kathy and Joe as well. Excellent. Timing's everything. I have this uh, mentoring group. It's about 17 women of color. They're mid-level managers and investing lots of time in them. And so recently, um, we talked about microaggressions. I had a topic, one of the books that we talked about, um, I just extracted information and came to microaggressions. I had no idea how, how much of a topic that would be, but that's just not at our company, that's just in the industry. 
So being able to listen, I, I recommend if you have not listened to your people of color, that's the first thing, thing is to schedule time just to listen, not to be defensive, let people have a voice. It's been very refreshing. And number two, uh, again, advocacy from my mentoring group, who can I go advocate for? And advocacy really means pushing the limits, standing up where um, they, these individuals that I stood up for would never have gotten that visibility and they rightly deserve it. And then um, the other one I wanted to mention would be looking at your calendar. When you decide what's important, how often are you having discussions about diversity, about inclusion? So looking at your calendar tells me a lot. So I make sure on my calendar, I'm mentoring more than I normally would, but I make sure I, I, I create space because it's an important initiative and we don't want it to be a flash in the pan. It has got to be changed. And so the other part that's important I do is have conversations with the very top at my organization on how can I help be part of the solution and, and not if we bring any challenge to the table, I offer solutions, but we want to have it front and center. So those are some of the things I'm Great. personally invested in. Great. Jason James, over to you. Sure. From our perspective, it's much of what we've talked about. How do we get a more diverse candidate pool? That includes going after and recruiting at uh, historically black colleges. It includes anonymizing data within resumes. So we avoid uh, bias, whether it be unintentional racism bias, uh, ageism, location bias, right? Get that more ca uh, diverse candidate pool. When people come in, what are their uh, mentoring opportunities? And like I said, I run a program every Monday called Mentorship Mondays, where I dedicate several hours on my schedule to mentor anyone within the organization. And then on top of it, we're being very transparent about not only discussing topics that matter to employees, like Black Lives Matter, but openly sharing stories of employees of color and what it means to be Black and what it means that they go through. because. I, I'm not from that background. You don't need to hear my story. I need to hear your story. I want people to understand all the differences that make up net health is what makes us great. And so we're, we're showcasing that and giving people an opportunity. And, you know, so much that, you know, two of the women that report directly into my organization started their own internal uh, WIT chapter, you know, Women in Technology. And I was super proud of that because it, it sprang forth from their ideas, right? We, we gave a fertile bed for people to be able to shine and they planted those seeds and they're growing. And I'm very excited about that. That's great. So Kathy, and we have exactly two minutes left. So Kathy, one minute for you and one minute for Joe. Great, I will say expand your network. For 20 years since I started a nonprofit for women in technology, I've been taking courtesy interviews with women and people of color and really getting to know their backgrounds. So even if you don't have an opening now, get to know people so that as you expand your network and expand your organization, you might already know people with different parts of backgrounds and points of view, different, different uh, thoughts that they can bring to the organization. That's great, thank you. Joe. Yes, thank you. So. Um, those of us that know us in Atlanta, we give back to the community a lot. And I think we've, we've taken a hard look at who we give back to, um, and, you know, looking at diverse organizations or where we can support young people specifically in diverse organizations. We are going to raise the, you know, they're, they're the ones that are going to raise the bar. They're the ones that are going to make the changes. Uh, awareness is coming now. It should continue to come, but it's those, it's those kids right now that, um, are, are growing up in this, learning from it, and they'll be the ones that make the change when we're long gone. Um, so taking, listening to our employees and investing in diverse organizations within the Atlanta area as, as we do today. That's great, thanks Joe. And this pretty much brings us to a close. What I wanted to mention is in my firm, Diversified Search, uh, we're the only search firm that has a black CEO, um, Dale Jones. And I guess we sort of put our money where our mouth was on this topic. And uh, we're kind of proud of that. Um, so Hunter, thank you. And thank you, Jackie, Joe, Jason, and Kathy for, for being panelists. This is an important topic. I thank you all for your contribution. Hunter, we're, I think we've hit our time limit. So over to you to start dishing out the prizes.
Hey, Tony, as always, you deliver an awesome job. Really appreciate it, Jackie, Kathy, uh, Jason, and Joe. Great to have you all on the program. Uh, yeah, we're going to wrap it up here, folks. Uh, you know, this is a program we've been uh, running now for 10 years straight uh, that started off as a top transformational CIO awards uh, recognition program. We launched it in New York City uh, back in 2010. Uh, we recognize, I think, the first year, ten, eight to 10 CI, global CIOs delivering transformational uh, value. Three or four buckets of criteria. One, that they're actively engaged with the network. Uh, two, that they uh, truly are demonstrating interesting innovation and transformation initiatives, driving interesting transformation initiatives uh, within their company. Three, that they're recognized as a industry uh, thought leader that people do go to as a go-to uh, individual. And four, finally, is giving back, just really being connected uh, to the broader world, the broader community. Uh, and so we morphed the program in the past two or three years into a global platform, a global program, and it's the HMG Strategy Top Tech Executives to Watch uh, Awards Program. And today we have two recipients, Gary Brantley, CIO of the City of Atlanta, and Jay Farrow, CIO of Quick Creek. You heard from both of them earlier today. We have two different really interesting clips here, video clips that we're gonna run regarding their, program, their progress with their team and their organization. Gary's up first, I believe. On behalf of the city of Atlanta and Atlanta Information Management, I'm happy to accept this award. As you know, these awards are only uh, made possible because you have a strong team. And so I have my team on this video uh, and so I want them to wave. Thank you guys for all the hard work that you put in to make this possible. Um, this has been a, a great year and it's been a great ride. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Jay Farrow, CIO for the Quick Creek Companies. And um, I am proud to introduce my, my leadership team. I'll let them say their names and, and, and what their role is, but uh, these are the folks who make all the magic happen here at Quick Creek IT. Thank you, Jay. My name is Dwayne Hall. I'm the Director of Infrastructure and Operations here at the Quick Creek Companies. And finding out about this award that's going to be given to Jay, I want to say it's well-deserved. Congratulations, Jay. Since you've joined the organization, your vision and your leadership has helped us to accomplish a lot in a short period of time. So we really do appreciate your guidance and direction, and the award is well-deserved. Thank you, Dwayne. I am uh, Jeff Corridge. I'm the Director of Enterprise Applications. and it's been a quick read a year, and one of the more compelling reasons I came to quick read was Jay and, his, and how impressive his leadership is, and have not regretted any day that I've been here. And what a truly honoring reward for Jay, and congratulations. Thank you, Jeff. This is Noah Bliss. I'm the Information Security Manager at QuickCrete and just wanted to congratulate Jay on receiving the HMG Top Technology Executives to Watch Award. Uh, just with the skill, style, personability, and the staffing choices that he's made, uh, it's really no surprise that you won. And uh, your victory is really just another reminder that we do have the best. So good job. Thanks, Noah. I'm Allison Fleeshold. I'm the Director of BI and CRM. And I've only been here for a short period of time. But um, it's been amazing working with you, Jay. Congratulations on your award. It's well-deserved, and I know that you're going to continue to do great things here and anywhere. Um, but thank you very much. You're, awesome. You're a great leader. Oh, you guys are – you're the best. And, and I just have to say that any award like this is really y'all's award. So the way I look at this, it's – I have the A-team. I am absolutely 100% blessed to have – all of you on my leadership team and, and the folks that are on your teams, you are absolutely the reason that we have accomplished so much over the last couple of years. And I'm proud uh, to be part uh, of this group with you. Thank you for everything you guys do. Thank Thanks, you. Jay. Congratulations. So two very, very well done uh, uh, presentations there. Great job. Hey, Gary's up first. Gary, you're truly a visionary and a collaborative strategist with your team and organization. You serve directly as a, as a chief technology advisor to the mayor of Atlanta. You've all been through a lot lately. Uh, it must have been challenging over the, over the past uh, three to six months. Uh, again, congratulations for you and your team. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, you know, the team, is they're the real true champions with this. And 
I tell them that all the time. We put a lot of expectations on them. We've had a couple of rough months. Um, uh, as you know, we, you know, we decided to take on this, this whole journey with the cyber attack that the city had. And so really building the team back up and really um, motivating them to take this on as a challenge has been one of the, I, I would say one of the most rewarding things that, that we've done. And also really being able to support the city. There were a lot of things going on technology wise with the with the riots and the looting and things like that that most people wouldn't see and the team stepped up to really make sure that when, when we had the entire world trying to attack us and, and and i mean the entire world um coming at us because of some of the things that had happened in the city of atlanta the team had stepped up and really uh made sure that we were okay and so i just want to say give a shout out to them this is all because because of them and so i'm just the storyteller of, of the work that they do Excellent. Congratulations, Gary, to you and your team. Uh, really amazing work, proud work. Thanks for being part of today's summit and being engaged with us. Thank you. Excellent. And Jay, Mr. Farrow, good to see you once again. Good to see you, we've been, we've been collaborating, I think, for over 10 years seamlessly. Great job today. And man, I, I'm just always blown away by uh, you, Jay, and your leadership and how you create great followers and build great teams and great people? Well, you know, I don't have many superpowers, um, but I, and I'm gonna give Kim Trevison credit for this phrase. She said, I don't have many superpowers and she's lying, she's quite good. But um, one I do have is identifying really, really good talent and setting them loose. And uh, the one thing they have in common is they're all better and smarter than I am. But uh, I'm just honored uh, to be your friend, Hunter, and to be part of this great organization, but also to even share this virtual stage with my good friend, Gary Brantley, who quite frankly has done some amazing things uh, for our great city of Atlanta uh, in very trying times. So uh, a shout out, Gary, to you and your amazing team and uh, holding this all together and recovering from what you did. But uh, it's an honor, Hunter, and thank you very much. Shout out to my team. It's all you. Excellent, Jay. Great job. Hey, Gary and Jay, would love to have you both presented at another summit uh, in the third or fourth quarter of this year and looking forward to seeing you in person in 2021. You got it, Hunter. Excellent. Thank, you. Thank you. If I can present with Jay, I know I've made it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Awesome job, guys. Take care. Okay, well, another great summit, folks. Uh, hey, big shout out to uh, the Atlanta Sim chapter. Uh, our friends at the Inspire CIO Group, uh, as well as our partners today, Appian, Commvault, Darktrace, Magenic, and Zoom. Uh, we look forward to uh, really launching additional programs and initiatives here in the near future. So please spread the word regarding uh, the HMG platform, uh, digital summit series, as well as uh, my new books coming out in about three weeks. Uh, the digital copy will be available in three weeks, and we're going to start giving away 50 copies to uh, attendees at every summit. So hopefully you'll win one of those today, uh, as well as the author's note will be going to everyone that attended, uh, that signed up today. So stay, stay connected, stay uh, in touch and uh, be safe. Thank you.